This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode, alongside my co-host Bob Pastorella, we chat with masters of horror about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. And today is episode 400. And we are so happy to have reached this milestone. How you doing, Bob? I am doing great. I'm doing I'm doing four hundred episodes of This Is Horror Great. Yeah, yeah. That's that's, a, that's where I'm at right now. It's a pretty high level of great and to mark the occasion we are chatting with Jeffrey Reddick, the creator of Final Destination. And We decided to go with Jeffrey for this episode because we are going to be chatting more to people within cinema. We're going to be talking to screenwriters and directors and other professionals within the business. Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to stray away from our book roots. And in fact, in episode 401, we're talking with the literary legend Craig Clevenger. But it does mean that you'll have more conversations with screenwriters, directors, and those in film. And what better way to kick that off than with Jeffrey Reddick? And I think the really good thing is that there's a lot that we can learn from studying, you know, film and script and things like that, that we can apply to prose and, and story writing because it's story creation, it's, it's form, it's function, it's, uh, it's structure, uh, there, there's a lot to be, to look, you know, to be learned with that. And so to, to kind of cast that wide net, this is, you know, it, it's, I think it's integral that we, that we kind of, we, we cast it out and we, we get these writers in and creators in to see a different perspective. Yeah. And talking about casting a wide net and, showcasing different perspectives i mean it's always been very important to keep things fresh with this as horror to keep us at the top of our game and so for the next 100 episodes we are going to have more first time guests than any other 100 episode stretch in this as horror history and to show how serious we are about that we can only have a maximum of five repeat guests in the next hundred episodes. So, you know, there are going to be so many new voices to the This Is Horror podcast. The only exception to that rule is if we have our own book launches, then, you know, we might have special guests that have been on the show before. And then, of course, there's the This Is Horror awards show as voted for by the This Is Horror readers and listeners, where we chat with the winners of the This Is Horror Awards, but apart from that, a maximum of five repeat guests because we really want to chat with new, fresh voices who have not been on the podcast before. Yes, I think it's very, very important. Um, we there, there are a lot of new voices, movers and shakers, and and people that are established that have never been on the show and. To do this and to do it the way we feel, do it the right way, is that we have to we have to structure it like this. Um, and it, I'm I'm excited because there's you know that's one of the things that that I really enjoy, you know that I get pleasure from is is talking to to especially to new writers that have you know that have struck it out and they 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 worked. We get to we get to to hear with what they put into it and what what got them into the horror genre and and how they're expressing themselves in their stories and that's to me the, the most exciting part 
Oh yeah, without a doubt. And this is an especially long episode of This Is Horror Podcast, which I'm sure a lot of you are used to when it comes to these milestone episodes. But, you know, for having Jeffrey Reddick on, we couldn't really split episode 400 into part one and part two. You know, that would be known as episode 400 and 401. So you've got the full two hour plus conversation as one episode. So strap in for that one. Yeah, it's going to be um, an interesting uh, conversation. Um, Jeffrey, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's done so much and um, he, he is, was just really happy to be on the show and, and you can tell it's just, and we loved it. It was great. I think everybody's going to really enjoy this. Now, before we get Jeffrey on the show, I believe, Bob, that you have his bio. Jeffrey Reddick is an American screenwriter and film director. He's best known for creating the Final Destination franchise. And his most recent film, uh, Don't Look Back, is out now. He's the writer-director on that. It's available on video demand in the U.S. And in the U.K., it will be available on June 14th. And that is Jeffrey Reddick. All right, well, before we get into the conversation, a little bit of an advert break. Dracula's Death, the 1921 Hungarian silent film, was the first motion picture to ever depict Count Dracula. While the film itself is lost, a prose adaptation has survived. Strangers from Nowhere is proud to present an illustrated English translation of Dracula's Death, available in ebook and paperback on Amazon and as a numbered and signed hardcover edition at strangersfromnowhere.com. Spacefaring researchers disturb an ancient horror. An enchanted object curses a grieving widow. A haunted reel torments a film student. A murder trial hinges on a chilling testimony. Howls from Hell A new horror anthology from HAL Society Press. Stephen Graham Jones calls it quality horror by true believers who can write. With a foreword by Grady Hendrix, HAL's From Hell unveils the horror writers of tomorrow with spine-tingling stories from P.L. McMillan, Shane Hawk, J.W. Donnelly, Lindsay Ragsdale, Amanda Nevada DeMille, and others. Available now in paperback, ebook, and audiobook from Amazon and most other major booksellers. Howls from Hell. Okay, with that said, here it is. It is episode 400 with Jeffrey Reddick on This Is Horror. <laughs> Jeffrey, welcome to This Is Horror podcast. Hi, thanks for having me on, guys. Evan. I hope you all are doing well. Yeah, we're doing great. This is our 400th episode, so we're very excited about that milestone. Oh my God, that's amazing. That is amazing. So I'll have to be, I'll have to like bring my A game. Well, I mean, I don't (laughs) bring in, you know, the creator of Final Destination was A game enough. So, you know, if you can take it to the next level i guess in the uk we used to call that an a star that's so funny we were actually um yeah final destination was trending on twitter today because i guess some tiktok um person had posted a video of a log had flown off their truck in front of them and went through their windshield so um Mm -hmm. yeah i woke up this morning my friends were sending me screen grabs i'm like you're you're trending on twitter i was like that's hysterical yeah um <laughs> man that that's amazing and i mean you you can't say that for a lot of films that if they're not playing at that current moment that they're trending on social media kind of 21 <laughs> years later yeah yeah no it's pretty cool something happened at work the other day where there was water on the floor and we needed to clean it up and somebody was sliding around and some one of my coworkers walked in and she almost slipped and she grabbed something that moved and she was like, Oh fuck, I'm in a final destination. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, the I mean, whole world is a fi- <laughs> the whole world is a final destination movie. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, I think so. And of course, <laughs> I mean, when the original came out, the first few deaths, I mean, you kind of wondered if the enemy was liquid because liquid kind of heavily featured into those first few deaths. Yeah, there's a little. Yeah, I, I do a lot of. Yeah, I like working in a genre. So I think, you know, even with like, don't look back, there's a vibe to Final Destination. I was trying to stay away from it, but it still got in there. Um, <laughs> it's... Oh, yeah. I mean, I think there are a number of parallels and we'll definitely be getting into those over the course of the conversation. But I thought to begin with, if we could take things all the way back to the start of your life, in fact, because I wonder what early life lessons you learned growing up in a small town in Kentucky? Um, it was a really, it, it built, you know, you, it was a very character building kind of scenario um, because, you know, we grew up um, from a young age till I, you know, left um, in college on a very small farm, um, you know, way, way, way out of town, like for a 35, 40 minute drive from town, which was just kind of a, very small hub with a grocery store and, and um, school and department, small department store. So we didn't even really have a big town. So we were very salt of the earth. Like we had our own garden. We, you know, grew our own livestock to eat. So it was very much like living off the land kind of growing up. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it was a different time. Um, you know, there certainly weren't a lot of people of color where I grew up. It was like, me, my sister, and two other kids from grade zero through the college in that area. So, um, you know, back when I was growing up there, it was, you know, there was, a you know, dealing with a lot of kind of racism that was going on at the time. But it was, you know, you learned that it was more people's ignorance of not knowing anybody who wasn't like them. So their prejudice was coming from a place where, you know, once they got to know you and spend time with you, you could see people evolve. So, um that was a life lesson I learned as well. It's I, I know in times like now when everything is so politicized and people just, you know, they're like, well, if you don't agree with me, I don't want to even talk to you anymore. Um, you know, I grew up in a time where it's like, yeah, like I knew people that were really racist when I met them because they didn't know any better. You know, they'd never been exposed to anything else. And through talking to them and listening and, you know, people come around. So it's like, that was one of the biggest life lessons I think I learned is like, just knowing that people are people and even if you have differences of opinion or you know some certain people have been raised a a certain way that other people haven't and we kind of all take it for granted that everybody was raised to believe like we believe and um that's mostly not the case like everybody has their own experiences so you have to kind of you know meet people where they are and you know try to communicate with them if there's like prejudices there you're trying to overcome but you know, nothing, nothing ever gets solved by just saying, you know, well, screw this whole group of people because they don't believe the way I do. Um, so I don't want anything to do with them. It's like, well, they still live in the world um, and you have to deal with them. And um, so I think that's probably what, you know, kind of dealing with people on a more human level, even though I obviously kill them all the time in my movies. But yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah I'm sure I picked up some if I did more slasher stuff, I'm sure I've, I've got I've got some, you know. I don't want to get Pete out on my ass, but you know, I, you know, we killed our own livestock. So I've, I've got some good graphic images for people. If I ever d- decided to do like a Texas Chainsaw Massacre kind of horror film, um, yeah, <laughs> I, could, yeah. I could recall. Um, but yeah, I mean, I love, I, you know, I loved growing up there um, just because it did give me a different sense of the world than I would have got if I'd have grown up in another area. And it also, I think that, you know, the place I grew up has evolved so much since I grew up there that it's just nice to see. Um, But, you know, it was definitely a time when you didn't have to worry about locking your doors, you know, at night. And, you know, if you were going out of town, your neighbors had your, you know, you know, they'd watch your property. So you didn't have to worry about stuff. And it was, it was a tough time, but it was also a more innocent time in a way um, than it is now. Yeah. And I suppose as you, mentioned Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I mean, if you were to put 
a kind of movie in that vein together. I mean, the great thing about it was at the time it was such a low budget feature that, I mean, you could use that expertise from growing up on the farm to actually craft the set together. You could use uh, oh, yeah. some of the slaughtered livestock as a prop. I mean, well, you could back then. You probably couldn't yeah. now. I mean, they they literally yeah. did, in fact. <laughs> Oh yeah, no that I I I'm glad I didn't have to go through it, but I've enjoyed reading all the stories about about them making that movie. I know the cast went through hell, but yeah, um, it it yeah, they were definitely or will always be a part of cinematic history. I mean, that movie is just so iconic. Yeah, um, I think two of the movies that seem to have the kind of worst conditions in terms of using actual animal blood are probably the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and then the original Day of the Dead, both of which uh, involved oh, yeah. very hot conditions and uh, a lack of refrigeration, particularly for um, one of the death scenes in Day of the Dead. <laughs> oh, where he got pulled apart? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, remember, I read about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I know when we had rain on our rain machines in our set, like, well, none of the actors are complaining, but um, I was like, yeah, this is, you know, we just have to dry them off. This is pretty quality problems instead of having to worry about like smelly animal entrails <laughs> in the sweltering heat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, though I suppose, I mean, all of these lessons and living off the land, it, will serve you well if there is some sort of apocalypse and i mean these days you never know uh -oh. yeah like i'm not very yeah i'm not I, do, I we still have our you know we still have our farm back in kentucky my sister and i so i always know like if if, if everything goes to hell i could always go back there <laughs> all right so if it all kicks off that's the safe house <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> it's a hell of a trip to get back home but i it I could still make it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, I'm going to die in an apocalypse. I grew up in a city. And it's, you know, I live in Texas. So it's like, Bob, you, you don't hunt, you don't fish. I'm like, no, my dad didn't like any of that stuff. And we had a choice and we chose not to go. But I would be dead in those situations. I wouldn't make it. <laughs> you I know, just... I couldn't live off the land. I can't even go camping. <clears throat> I'm like, you don't have a bathroom, a restroom? No, I'm not going to go. That's all right. Thank you. <laughs> well, I didn't say I st <laughs> <laughs> like I wasn't very I wasn't very good at hunting because, uh, yeah, the I remember the first time I shot a rifle, it like knocked me on my ass because um, of kickback. And um, yeah, my mom would go out and like kill snakes in the yard and stuff like that. So I'm probably toughening myself up a little bit. My sister, now my sister would be the one like going out. It would be, I'd be the one at home, like <laughs> watching the news and she'd be going out and, and, and killing stuff. Um, Cause I did. Yeah. I, I have a, I have a hard time with, you know, like I ran over a turtle once when I was mowing the lawn and like broke down, you know, I just <laughs> with animals and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But if I had to do it for survival, damn it, I would. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think Clive Barker proved that in one of his stories that you will eat. <laughs> oh, if you have to. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember the name of the story, but then he it was a psychological experiment with the with vegetarian and starving him to death. Yeah, I remember I can't I was trying to think of the name when you mentioned. I know what story you're it's talking in Books about. of Blood. Remember. Books of Blood, yeah. I just can't yeah. remember the name of the story. It's Somebody will post too. about it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I mean, I understand that one of the first horror films that you watched was Salem's Lot. And it was kind of watched in secret because your mother was watching it. And then you decided to sneak into the hallway and watch from there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so can you yeah. tell us a bit about that? Yeah, no, it was funny because your mom, my mom watched Salem's Lot, but she said it was too scary for me and my sister so she made us go to bed but yeah i snuck in the hallway um and watched it and i just i remember the part where the uh danny like where the kid shows up in the window and is scratching on the window and that scared me so much that my mom and my sister shared a bed um and i w had my own room but i was too afraid to sleep in my room so i would sneak in my mom's room and sleep by the bed 
like for four nights, I think I did. But my sister knew that I was doing that. So she'd bring shit to bed and like throw stuff at me <laughs> at night because she knew that I couldn't do anything because if mom found out, she would have got really mad that I watched the movie. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much me and my sister's relationship in a nutshell. <laughs> like, yeah. I love her to death, but that's totally my sister. So, yeah, that movie I saw, I didn't watch the whole thing. I just remember sneaking out and watching parts of it. But I, you know, happened to sneak out and watch one of the scariest scenes of the movie. <laughs> and yeah. That scene just yeah terrified me so um oh yeah that was a never forget that yeah i can still remember being in the hallway and watching that and being like oh (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's a good job that you didn't make too loud a reaction or you'd have been rumbled i yeah i didn't make any reaction because my mom would have whooped you know this was back in the days when parents whipped their child so i would have got a big whooping for that one yeah um so, yeah, so I, I just stayed quiet and let my sister throw stuff at me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so do you think, was it watching Salem's Lot that first unlocked your interest in horror, or did something happen before that? Um, I When I was younger, I was really into, like, Greek and Roman mythology, which has, you know, horrific stuff in it and monsters in it. Um, I used to read those stories all the time. Um, I think what got me hooked on horror is actually when I was a teenager, like I started hanging out with some friends in Kentucky who watched them all the time. And it, it, you know, at the time, if you were a kid and watching those, everybody was like, what's wrong with you? How can you watch those kind of movies? So there was kind of like a forbidden, you know, thing to it, you know, like watching something bloody and scary that other people were like, how could you watch that filth? And um, so, yeah, I, I, I think me and my friends just started, you know, I had one friend in particular, Tony, that loved horror films and um, Tony Calhoun. And he would, you know, always be like, oh, I found this really gory movie and you, this Italian, you know, and so he would show me all these films. And so I started really getting into them. And then, um, you know, our parents weren't really happy that we were watching them, but they also were like, well, they're just staying at home and staying out of trouble. So we'll let them watch them. Um, you know, so we weren't out like drink it or you know do it anything bad so they they kind of just like l- let us have that as our escapism and then we just got into all the behind the scenes stuff we started reading fangoria so we'd we'd always like talk about how they made the special effects and movies and so then it became more of it was fun but it was also a hobby as you know we would do we'd make each other up at home like with bloody you know makeup on ourselves and, and you know so we got into like the behind the scenes stuff which kind of helped make the scary stuff not as scary, but it, this it was still, especially when you're younger, that stuff was still really scary. Um, so yeah, that's what got me, uh, you know, into heart. That's what I think the mythology stuff, you know, was kind of my gateway drug <laughs> into horror. Um, and then when I, yeah, when I was a teenager, me and my friend just got like hardcore into like horror and like let's find the bloodiest movies we can find and the scariest movies we can find. Yeah, and I suppose that begs the question, what do you think, growing up, was the scariest movie you found? Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street was actually the the movie that just blew my mind in so many ways. And and it was it was funny because I just remember I saw previews for it and I I read later that something happened when they processed the film originally and it ended up washing the print out a little bit so it wasn't as crisp and sharp as it and the color wasn't as bright as it should be so i remember seeing the trailers on tv and the and it looked like cheap because it just didn't the it just looked cheap because it was a little washed out i was like oh this looks kind of cheap and cheesy so i wasn't even wasn't expecting much from the movie and then we went to see a double feature of alone in the dark Nightmare on Elm Street, and they played Alone in the Dark first, which I thought was a good scary movie. And I just hadn't read up on Freddy. Um, and so I, I went in blind. You know, I thought Tina was going to be the lead. So when they killed her, it blew. I was like, what the hell is going on here? And then all the special effects. And then Freddy was so scared. Like, I just was blown away by the movie. Um, and it really it scared me, but it fascinated me. I think a movie that scared me. I'll just sidetrack because Nightmare on Elm Street is like my favorite movie ever. But I think the movie that scared me the most, and I also blame my friend Tony for this because he's like, I'm going to go to bed. You watch this movie. And he had one of those really big 
like in Nightmare on Elm Street three, that huge TV. <laughs> um, no, no, it's not Nightmare. There was a, there was, there's a, there's one movie where there's a video drum or something where there's a big gra- TV that's on the ground, like huge, but um, some of the tubes were busted, so it was a little faded. Um, and so he put in Evil Dead, <laughs> and then went to bed, <laughs> and had me watch Evil Dead, and that movie scared the shit out of me. Um, because I was I was very young when I saw that, and I just remember, you know, sitting in his creaky house watching this big TV, and everybody was asleep, and that you know I had to finish it, but it really scared the hell out of me. <laughs> but Nightmare on Elm Street blew me away. Like that was the one that really just blew me away when I saw it because it was just so well done, and I'd never seen anything like it before. Yeah, and in terms of the scares, I mean, the original Evil Dead isn't messing about. And I think sometimes no. people forget that because of the comedic bent that was obviously in Evil Dead too. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was really intense and gruesome and creepy. Yeah, it was just, it was just a, yeah, very disturbing movie. And again, it, you know, I watch it now and I still love it. You know, I love it. You know, even though maybe some of the effects don't hold up, but you you watch movies for when they were made. And um, it's still just a really creepy, fun film, you know. But yeah, when I was young, it wasn't fun. It was just, I was just terrified. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I kind of love the idea that you went in for this double feature. You saw Alone in the Dark, and then you thought, okay, here comes the light relief. And <laughs> boy, yeah. oh boy, were you in for yeah. a surprise. Yeah, I, yeah, and I, I think I would have had the same reaction if I'd have gone in blind. But I really was expecting like Alone in the Dark to be the scary movie, and then like I thought Nightmare on Elm Street was just going to be cheesy. Um, and then I, yeah, watched it. And I was like, holy, yeah, I was just blown away by that movie. I still love it. I still will play it. You know, it's still my comfort. You mm-hmm. know, it's my comfort movie to go back to. Um, so is Scream. Wes Craven's in a, has a, you know, Wes Craven is the master master of the genre so um yeah i wish he was still around making movies but he left us some really great ones oh yeah me too i mm-hmm. second everything mm-hmm. that you said about wes craven and i mean a nightmare on elm street was so influential that it's my understanding mm-hmm. that you sent a 10 page treatment of a prequel <laughs> <laughs> you know, to the the studio, I think it was, and they sent it back at first, saying, "Well, they didn't accept unsolicited material." But you told them that you had paid three dollars to see the movie, so the least they could do is read your treatment, and they actually yeah. did. <laughs> yeah, that happens, you know, and it's it's something I think that only could have happened. I've heard a couple other stories um, in the industry over the years where something like that's happened, but. I think it was a perfect timing because Nightmare on Elm Street was blowing up, but, but New Line was still a smaller company. So, I mean, yeah, I wrote Bob Shea and sent him a prequel treatment, and he was very encouraging. And his assistant, Joy Mann, became like, you know, pen pals. And then when I got to New York, she was almost like a mother figure to me. You know, her and Bob got me an internship at New Line Cinema, and I stayed there for 11 years. But yeah, from age 14 till I was went to New York at 19, they would send me scripts and posters and, you know, just very read my stuff, just very encouraging, like in a way that, you know, you don't, people don't have to be. Um, but yeah, it's, I, you know, I always, I always give Wes Craven, um, Bob Shea and Joy Man credit for my career because, you know, if, I always I would have been in the business somehow like that was I would have figured out a way into the business somehow um, because I've always been planning that. Um, but just kind of coming in organically from my love of a movie that they that New Line produced um, and then staying there for so long and being at New Line when, you know, kind of at its I think I was there during its heyday, which was like, you know, early 90s through uh, 2001 um, before they got bought. Well, until the tail end, they got bought, you know, by Warner Bro- or Time Warner and then Warner Brothers. So, but, you know, I was there during kind of the creative heyday when they were making like movies that no other studio would make. And then they would make profits. And then people would be like, oh, who would have thought people wanted to see a movie about a black vampire killer or see about a, ma- a guy who puts a mask on and he does wacky things? Um, 
you know, they would just make these movies that no other studio would make. And um, it was a really, yeah, it was a really special place to work. A yeah. lot of great people made, made a lot of great friends um, there. So, yeah, yeah. It was, and it's funny. I got to, yeah, I basically got to work at the house that Freddie built. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. Yeah. It must have been so exciting to be in the midst of that buzz and to, as you say, be there during the heyday. Yeah, it was great. I worked in the New York office, so it was definitely more, the. I mean, they still did a lot of creative stuff there, but it was more the corporate office. So I wasn't out in Hollywood, which is good. I think it was good to be in New York because I got to focus on how the, you know, just how the business worked behind the scenes. And I think if you were, if I'd been in the Hollywood office, I'd have probably been more watching like all the kind of bullshit phony stuff, mm. you know, where people are coming in and trying to sell stuff and they're being, you know, they got their sales stuff on. And, and so I think I got to learn the real business behind the business at New Line in New York. And then we would still have like, you know, the premieres and, you know, people based out of New York that were doing stuff. So it was a nice mixture, but it was, it was a lot of the nuts and bolts stuff that was really cool to learn and, in, in the New York office and um, yeah. And then I could, you know, I could go through the archives and find old, you know, pictures from the movies and posters and just dig through old scripts. And yeah, it was just like a gold mine, you know, creatively. Um, and then also just seeing all the stuff that was going on with nightmare, you know, as they made more of them. Yeah. It was just cool. And I'm wondering when did you first know that you wanted to work in the movie business and when did you first know that you wanted to write story um i've always wanted to be in the movie business like i literally i've talked to relatives who were like when you were six years old we asked you what you were going to do when you grew up and you said you're going to be a movie star so you i always wanted to act um i unfortunately my ambition was a little the industry had not caught up with my ambition because when, when I started in New York, again, this was the early nineties and, um, you know, I, I got an agent very quickly and I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, um, for us, their summer program and I got an agent right off the bat. But my agent was like, I just don't know what to do with you. There aren't it. Basically at that time, she's like, you know, if, if you don't rap or you don't play basketball, like there's really, there aren't any roles being offered for people like you. So diversity was not a big thing back in the 90, early 90s. And they were like, we could maybe get you like a guest spot on the Cosby show. Um, <laughs> uh, and I ended up doing a lot of like, you know, under five and background work on some soaps, which was fun and movies as well. But as far as like actual acting roles, you know, there just weren't there were such a small number of roles for actors who were any ethnicity other than white. So you know, when my agent told me that, she's just like, you're really good. I just don't, there aren't parts to put you up for. I'm really sorry. And that's when I decided, well, screw it. I'll just start writing. Um, cause that was my kind of my favorite subject besides acting was, was English, um, and writing. So then I decided, well, I'll just, I'll write stuff and put myself in it. But then, you know, you know, when final destination comes out, you know, I, that came out when I was 30. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I couldn't play high school um, for Final Destination. So, you know, I, you know, and I was kind of following the marketplace at that point. So, um, and I, you know, I've, I haven't really enjoyed writing and I've moved more into producing directing now, but um, still love writing and, but I still have the acting bug, like that never leaves you. So at some point, you know, and I, I'm telling my friends it's going to have to probably be sooner rather than later. I don't want to wait till I'm like 60, you know, and then put myself in something. Um, so, I'll, uh, you know, I mean, I've done cameos and stuff like that, but yeah, I've always, I've always loved the entertainment industry. I think that, you know, the arts are so important and I think it's one of the, you know, anytime there's a slashing of a budget at a school, you know, they'll slash the arts programs first, you know, music or, or acting or painting or singing or anything. And, you know, I think just studying history, art has been such an important part of our history, but, you know, and you know, in this country in particular, I think it's not seen as a real occupation. I mean, every time I told people I wanted to be an actor, they're like, well, yeah, but what are you going to do for a real job? You know, that's what you, that's your fantasy, but what are you going to do for a real job? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's kind of the attitude we have in this country towards the arts is there's like, 
you know, we just, you know, we certainly love to go be entertained at movies and, you know, love to read books that we enjoy. But I think the appreciation of the, the artists and, you know, encouraging people to pursue art is like something that's just not encouraged. I, I didn't see it. It kind of, I mean, I had teachers, obviously like English teachers would encourage you to write, but you know, we didn't have an art class. We had an arts and crafts class, but it was heavy on the crafts. So you could learn to build stuff. Um, but yeah, we just don't appreciate the arts, um, like we should. And, and if you look throughout, you know, history, I mean, art is kind of what stand, you know, withstands the test of time, you know, like, paintings and sculptures and books and plays and you know those are the things that people remember um and they tell stories about people from that time that people can learn from and like, again i just don't i mean I'm, I'm saying all this highfalutin stuff when i'm again writing about murdering people um <laughs> <laughs> but the, you know there's i definitely you know try to deal with universal things in my work and um tell stories that people you know can relate to no matter what culture they come from or what background they have. And, um, you know, I try to say stuff of my work. I just, I don't, since I love genre film so much, I, I, it's not, you know, I'm not going to turn around. I don't think and write some Oscar bait kind of drama at some point. Cause those, I like watching some of those movies, but those stories just don't appeal to me creatively as far as writing them. Um, that's a whole other skill set that, I don't envy people that, that do that all the time, but, um, I just, I like entertaining people, but then I also like to leave people thinking, you know, when they finish a film. So that's my art yes. feel. Yeah. <laughs> support the arts. It's very, that's important. when art's most, of, that's when it's most effective is when it lingers and it makes an impression. Yeah. And it, it you know, it affects you emotionally whether you're in you know, joy, sadness, pain, you know, ecstasy, it doesn't matter. Yeah. My piece of my soul dies every time I hear about a, you know, the arts being slashed, budgets, things like that. You know, it, it's, it really, it really pains me. And, you know, and I, I, I know of the, you know, what are you going to do for a real job? You know, I, yeah. I deal with that. I, I deal with that now when I, yes. have, you know, because you know, I have a day job. I got district managers, you know, they're like, well, when, you've been with this for a long time. Why don't you uh, move into management? I'm like, well, I've got other passions. They're like, beyond the company? And I'm like, yeah, this is a yeah. job. Yeah. It pays the bills. It has benefits, but I'm not going to have this etched on my tombstone. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah and that's always a balancing act of work too it's like you want to because it is it is a especially if you're working in, in any kind of business it's tough but if you're trying to work in the arts in a society that doesn't really support it you know and now it's like with the internet which is great for opportunities it provides people but now you have people that are just like famous for doing nothing but you know <laughs> like <laughs> they just show people how to, you know, how they curl their hair every day. And it's like, okay, that person's famous. Let's put them in a movie or let's give them a TV show. And it's like, what, what about all these other people? <laughs> mm. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a crazy world out there right now, but there's a lot more opportunities now I think with the internet um, and with technology being like, you can shoot a 4k movie on an iPhone. So there's, there's so many more opportunities now for people to learn. Mm-hmm. You know, I, uh, when I talk to classes and stuff like that, I mean, you know, you know, students still, the first thing they ask me, how do I get an agent? How do I get a meeting at a studio? I'm like, don't, <laughs> like, don't worry about that. And it's true. Like the studios, if you look at the movies they're making, they're all remakes, sequels, something based off of a existing game or comic book or something, an IP that's already out there. Like the big studio movies, they they don't, they don't make any movie that's not going to be like, four quadrant you know guaranteed hit but you've got like hundreds and hundreds of other companies out there that didn't exist before the studios that are making movies and you can shoot your own movie and edit it and get it online and start you know building a career so i have noticed that the people that have that are growing up with the technology right now don't necessarily appreciate how 
far we've come. Like, you know, we were shooting stuff on VHS, <laughs> VHS cameras and lugging those around. And, you know, and now you've got iPhones that you can put a whole movie, on, you know, shoot a 4K movie on. It's amazing what you can do now with technology. And um, I think it's going to be interesting to see where, you know, the, the new generation of filmmakers comes from. Because I don't think it'll necessarily be through the film schools. Um, and I think I think a lot of them are going to be like these surprise people that like create something special that like goes viral. Um, mm. So yeah, it's, it's just interesting. Yeah. And you said earlier, you know, you were throwing all these highfalutin terms around, but you write about murdering people, and I have to say oh. to that. I mean, so did Shakespeare. You look at Titus Andronicus. Thank you. So, yes, he murdered. Oh, he murdered. Every, he, people were always uh, dying in his stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is true. Damned in the back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's funny. It does. It feels like. Um. And and I and I, I actually do say that as a joke because most of my most of my scripts aren't just like oh let's just get a bunch of pretty people together and have them have sex and, and murder them like they're you know. Whether it turns out in the execution or not, the stories are at least about other other things. You know, you know. Obviously, *Final Destination* is about you know mortality, and mm. especially when you're young and facing mortality. And *Camera* was about you know bullying, and um, you know *Don't Look Back* is about kind of people's apathy towards each other. Um, in this age of technology, where when people see something bad happening they'll pull out their phones and film it. And it's like, well, you should pull out your phone to call 911 first, right. then film it. But people don't even do that. And it just baffles me like that. We've turned into that kind of society where it's like, oh, if I film this, maybe I'll get, I'll go viral. And then, you know what I'm saying? And then uh, people will pay attention to me. And it's like, call 911 first. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Be a decent person and call 911 first, then film. Yeah. Um, if you then, must film. You know, karma is going to get you. Yeah. And you know, I always will. will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah. So, I, I do, I, I, I always joke about that because I, I do, when I, I'm just very, with arts programs again, I just, it's, it's not only because, you know, when people like pursue their passion in the art, it's like, it's very soul fulfilling. But those programs have also showed to like, really help disadvantaged youth and like you know i grew up in a very poor you know there's so many you know poor parts of the midwest and the south that you know where people are just living in poverty and you know the biggest thing i notice when i go back to visit there is like kids will be like oh well we never thought anybody could anybody from here could amount to anything like i hear that so much and it's so disheartening and it's not like art's the only way out it's not at all like you can work is a you know in a factory you can work at a store you can work at a hair salon you can work anywhere but you know when you let kids indulge in their artistic side you know that's where they're having fun and that's where they're exploring and being creative as opposed to like you know working at a job where it's like well you have to tabulate these numbers or you have to put these pieces together so it just you know it feeds a different part of them and i think you know can really encourage kids and give them hope um and give them a way to express themselves. Um, and that's a lot of the problems with, I think a lot of the, you know, troubles we have with our, our young kids today is, is, you know, now they're just learning to express themselves on Twitter, you know, and argue with people or, or things like that. And it's like, they're, they're not getting like constructive, like outlets. Um, and if they do want to be artists, you know, they're made fun of and they're, you know, mocked and they're nerds and they're, you know, I say, you know, a lot. I have to, my friend pointed that out. I have to quit doing that. I'll say something. I'll go, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I think, <laughs> I think a lot of us do, or we have other vocal tics or we say like, or I mean, um, mm-hmm. there's, there's all sorts of things. I, the, the problem is now that we've drawn attention to it, we're all going to be pausing or conscious or we'll say, you know, and be like, oh, God damn it. We said, you oh, know, no, again. I said it again. Yeah. 
It's so, almost like you can say like a whole sentence and never really say anything. Like, mm, you know? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and you and you, here's the thing: you know exactly what I meant too. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> you're like, well, mm, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a friend that's very good at deciphering, deciphering that. Then I have another friend who just calls me out on it all the time. He's like, No, I don't know, Jeffrey. You're jumping, you're jumping subjects here. What, which, what are we, and I, but I have some other friends that they just know how my, one of my friends um, told me, cause he said some people speak before they think and some people think before they speak. And I happen to speak as I'm thinking. <laughs> so um, I don't have much of a filter. That's why I'm always just like, if I do interviews, I'm like, you can, people can just ask me anything. Yeah. Cause I don't, I don't really try to hide anything. And I just feel like being honest about life and especially when you work in this business where, you know, yes, I, you know, Final Destination, you know, as a fan, especially, I say this with 100% sincerity, like I could literally have died like after doing that movie or never written another movie and be happy that I wrote something in the genre that I love that has had the resonance that that movie had, has had, like, I don't want it to be the only one, but I'm just saying, I honestly, that was my goal you know what I'm saying as a kid was to like do a horror movie that people remembered. Mm. So, you know, so that dream I fulfilled. So, you know, I don't, but, but with that success of Final Destination, there's a lot of people that don't, you know, work in the business that think a, that, you know, I live in a, you know, multi-million dollar mansion and, you know, I have a yacht and all this stuff. And, or people think that I can just get a movie made you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, if you like this trip, you can get it made. It's like they don't know the business. So there's a lot of like, you know, and there's a lot, a lot of people I think that kind of when they do interviews and stuff like they'd like to just do the Instagram version of interviews, you know, or if people just look at your Instagram feed, they're like, oh, wow, this person has the most awesome life because all they do is eat caviar and live on yachts and <laughs> hang out at the beach. Um, but then you talk to them and they're like, no, my, my life is more like Facebook than Instagram. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of like to just talk about my life because, you know, building up b bullshit about the business doesn't help anybody who wants to get into it. Um, but, you know, I'm also just very grateful for all the opportunities I've had. So it's, you know, it's not like I'm this like bitter guy that's going to be like talking smack about everybody. Yeah. I mean, I'll talk smack about somebody if they come up that we don't, you know, like if certain names are mentioned, I'm, I'm definitely will go full on smack. But, um, but, you know, I just, I just like to just be open and honest. So I, I try, I just really don't filter myself when I talk. Cause I, I, you know, I like people, so I don't talk shit about people. Um, and I'm just honest about the business. Cause again, I just know too, too many people that, you know, I'll talk to a class of like, well, we had a guest speaker last week that said this. And I'm like, they're full. Of, I mean, it was, it's just full of shit because they're just giving them like the false kind of holiday. Like, well, you have to go to film school and then try to get an internship at an agency or a studio. And it's like, no, you don't, you don't have to go to film school. Like film school can be great if you choose that. But now you have, again, you have the equipment, you have the tool. If you're a writer, you can find scripts online and, you know, read, you know, if you like sci-fi writing, you know, get a hundred, you know, find like the 50 best sci-fi screenplays online and read them. Like that's going to, that's going to teach you and writing is going to teach you like classes can be good, but also I think, you know, classes can also stomp out your original voice because it's all about, well, you have to follow this structure and this has to happen on this page and this has to, and you get people too much into like the, a formula where they start losing their creative, the thing that makes them creative. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, th I think just even my story, like there is another, there is a, a um, a colleague of mine, Jeff Katz, who worked at New Line, and he did the, he did a Bob Shea letter too, um, way after I did. I was the first Jeff to do it, um, but he did it way <laughs> after I did. Um, and Bob, you know, and so we're we kind of joked about it because he's like, "Yeah, I read about your letter, and then I wrote Bob a letter." But that doesn't have that. That was like such a convergence of like my intention was pure. Like I wasn't planning. Like, oh, if I get this. I mean, I thought it was brilliant. I can't, I don't have it anymore. I wish I'd have kept it. I remember the story was just very what you would think it was. Freddy Krueger's a janitor at this school and he's creepy and some kids go missing and then a kid gets away and then the parents find out 
and he gets off at the trial and then they burn her. You know, it was, it was the Freddie origin story that any 14 year old would think of. So it wasn't, but I, but when Bob Shea got back to me, he's like, you have a, cause some of my, I did have some creepy scenes in there and he's like, you have a really good imagination. Just study the craft more. Um, and that was the best advice I could give. And I studied by reading scripts that they would send me. Um, so I never went to like film school. Um, and you know, I think that that helped me a lot, just kind of finding my own voice and then also learning how to take constructive criticism. But, you know, like that, you know, my story is very unique in how I got into the business. And I know just as many people that have similarly unique stories or, you know, a lot of them did go to film school. And while they were in film school, got an internship at a studio and have done that. So there's no one way to get to your dream is, you know, that was my long ass way of saying that. Um, there's no one way to get to it, but you won't ever get to it if you, if you stop pursuing it, you know, if you kind of just give up, you'll, you'll never get to it. And sometimes it takes a lot longer. Like, you know, I, 30 was not old to have final destination come out. I, I, you know what I'm saying? But I started when I was 19 and I'd been writing since I was like 15 and acting. So I was like, yeah, it was, it was 30 when final destination came out. And then of course I was chasing that, you know, you, you have a hit movie come out, then you chase that dragon where every movie after that, you're like, this movie has to be a hit um, or I'll never work again. And then it's like, you don't have like a big theatrical movie come out for a long time. But then you all of a sudden say, wow, but I still have a library of movies, you know? And, you know, some of them are good and some of them aren't as great, but I've been working and, you know, my writing gets directors and actors work, you know, like there's a whole crew that's like feeding their families because of something that I started. Um, and you start really looking at it like that. And then you just kind of really stay in gratitude a lot more. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think a lot in life is just about how you frame it. So mm -hmm. I mean, particularly if you look at final destination yeah you could say oh it took me till i was 30 and i'd been writing seriously since i was 19 sent something in at 14 so you could be quite cynical or you know you could say well i fulfilled my childhood dream at age 30 because <laughs> yeah. i mean you said yourself so anything else after that is effectively a bonus you've already achieved your childhood dream so now you you're in this amazing situation where now you can have more dreams yeah my other childhood dream was to marry a prince from london <laughs> yeah <laughs> because cause i because i saw these when i was growing up i saw um because i'm i'm gay as well as well as whatever else um but i i saw uh, maurice in this movie in other country when i was young and so i was like I, because I, you know, I was living on this little small farm. I'm like, I'm going to go to London and I'm going to find a prince, a <laughs> British prince. And then um, Harry got taken off the market. And I'm like, damn it, that dream's destroyed. Yeah, um, that, that was a good one. <laughs> that, that childhood dream. So I still got one more childhood dream to fulfill. But, um, but yeah, the the horror one is completely, yeah, like I said, like that's that's how I look at it. And, and you know, of course, you learn to look at it like that afterwards like when it, the first one came out of course you know the the second one did well too so i you know i i um, came up with a story for the second one as well so i was grateful for that but then you know then it's like all right well your next non-final destination movie has to be a big hit and has to be in theaters and then when that stuff starts not happening then you have to really start putting stuff in perspective because then it, it's really easy to like go down the kind of the negative like path with your thinking and get jaded and bitter and it's just I'm not you know I'm just I managed to not stay or not get bitter or jaded um which is you know good <laughs> yeah yeah it's a good thing it's a good thing yeah it's a really it is. good way to live life <laughs> yeah and we certainly wish you the best of luck with your very specific dream to marry a prince from London I mean well he it depends it to be a it doesn't have to be a. I've seen the crown and all the. It doesn't have to be a prince. Okay, so um, we can take a wide <laughs> definition of prince. So anyone yes. listening, yeah. if you've got to be oh. from London, <laughs> could you even loosely define <laughs> as a prince? 
Yes. Even if your mom says, <laughs> even if your mom says you're a prince, I'll, at this point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> the bar has been lowered so effectively. The bar has been lowered. Effectively. Well, it's pretty big. So I mean, you know, this is we're talking about a wide area yeah. here, so this is good. Yeah. Is good. So are, are you no, it's, from it's, London? <laughs> It's so funny because, no, that's the one, like, literally that was the top of my travel list. Whenever I could afford to travel, I wanted to go. But I ended up, for work, going to France and then spent extra time in France because they were, I was only, they were only going to fly me out there for, like, four days. And so I just decided, I you know, to spend all my money on France. And then I just haven't had, you know, and now with COVID, of course, now traveling is is crazy. But... Yeah, like that's like my number one. I've been on to so many other places. I'm like, I still have not ever been to London. It baffles me mm. at this age. But that's a whole other, you know. <laughs> Just I do have know, to. That, know that you're loved in my heart. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Man, I gotta ask. You went to you went to France. I mean, did you did you have any uh, like you know deja vu? You know, getting on the plane. No, it's so funny because because um, <laughs> I mean if I I don't know this is the first thought that come to my head it'd be like you know hey fuck come on goddamn I'm going to France <laughs> yeah I'm not a can I switch it, flights <laughs> <laughs> well the funny thing is I didn't even realize it but it was originally called Flight 180 and I there and I think I just picked that number up because there was a direct flight from New York to L A that was Flight 180 um so uh-huh. then all, all all my friends in New York were like damn you Jeffrey <laughs> for naming it that um. But I, I love flying so much. Um, I don't do it, you know, I don't, you know, for conventions and stuff, maybe around Halloween I'll travel. But since I don't do it so much, I just really love it. So I don't really get, like, creeped out when I go to the airport. Like, I don't, I don't look for weird stuff. Like, I went to India um, for when Dead Awake came out in India. They flew me over there to uh, promote the film, but also to, like, talk to some of their film schools. And um, my luggage tag um was 180 so i took a video of it i'm like this is so cool and my friends are like are you crazy i'd be freaking out i'm like no it's cool (laughs) (laughs) um so yeah when i went to france i didn't yeah i didn't get any i I think it's the reverse like i've never had a fear of flying but like i definitely the log truck thing was something that i hated in kentucky that that we put in the second movie and so that's kind of the one thing like if i'm driving and I get behind any kind of truck with stuff piled up on it, I'll move lanes. Um, so that's something that still to this day gets me. But it's also now, it's it's almost like a, an, a meta thing now, where it's like, I'm driving behind a log truck, and people keep sending these memes. It would be really funny if I got an accident with a log truck, because that would just, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's a yeah. whole meta thing now. <laughs> oh, yeah. <with> the, <laughs> But I move too whenever I see a log truck because I mean I've seen some I've seen some crazy shit. Uh, <laughs> oh, I mean, they you know truckers they don't fuck around they do they're like we'll we'll put as we'll pile as much stuff on here as we can and yeah we'll, we're gonna get there before we get yeah, pulled over we'll get That's yeah absolutely they think. we're gonna get there before yeah, we get pulled over yeah absolutely so so you, I too yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, I've grown up seeing some janky piles of, like, that is just one bump in the road. All that stuff's going to go flying. And even people pack it, you know, driving their pickups with, like, mm-hmm. you know, bed, like bed, you know, rails and pipes sticking off the back. And you're, like, you yeah, don't even have stuff holding. So um, I'm used to that, you know, from growing up, too. So um, I've seen a, a rotted tailgate fall off the back of an old truck. In the highway, we're doing probably about 65 miles an hour, and this mm-hmm. this tailgate just fall. First of all, it hangs off by one bolt, and it's, you know, <laughs> sending sparks through the air. <laughs> yeah. And at that point, I'm going, I think I ought to move over to the next lane. And I watched this thing just rattle against the. You can hear it too. It sounded like somebody screaming, and then it just popped off. And bounced and flipped and then skid. And I'm thinking, oh, good, they're going to run over it. And I'm watching in my rearview mirror as the tailgate flies up in the air and hits a car's windshield. Bam! Oh, wow. They're all over the road. And I'm like, I'm just going to keep going. Yeah. I mean, and, and fortunately, 
I'm on a stretch of highway where there's always a cop. And sure enough, it's, I mean, within seconds, I could hear the sirens already. Yeah. I was like, oh, wow, this is this is good. But, <laughs> man, that when I seen them sparks, I was like, this is – and I, I had that Final Destination thought. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm just going to move over in this lane here yeah. and just get away from that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that you got the – initial spark of the idea when you were on a flight you read an article about this woman getting a call from her mother saying not to take a flight which Mm -hmm. then subsequently crashed now yeah i'm wondering so you're reading this on a plane was this at all troubling or just you know as a fan of flying and a fan of horror did you take it in your stride or did it make you nervous at all (laughs) no the funny thing is i remember no i I just thought oh that's interesting um and i just it's funny because i just filed it in the back of my head like i didn't immediately be like that's a great setup for a movie um but yeah it it didn't bother me sometimes i get there are times when i'm on a plane and something will happen and i'm like maybe i should be more afraid of flying if like we hit turbulence because i'm like the fact that I'm not worried about flying, <laughs> I'm like, maybe I should be a little bit more scared about flying. Um, so, Cause I have friends that'll check their airlines and their crash, you know, how many crashes has this airline had, and, you know? And I'm like, I don't even want to know about that, that stuff. Um, but no, it didn't bother me when I read it. I just kind of followed it as a way as like, Oh, that's a cool idea. And then, um, you know, when I was uh, talking to some literary agents, I said, well, you need to write a, an episode for a show that's on TV, like write a spec script. And so, you know, I love the X-Files and I remembered that article and I was like, oh, that would be a cool opening for like an X-Files episode. Um, and so I wrote kind of a, I wrote a script where it was like Scully's brother, Charles has a premonition and gets off the plane with some other passengers and then they start dying. And then, you know, the police think he's murdering them, but you know, Scully's convinced it's something supernatural. And, um, before I sent it, you know, I was going to actually have my agent submit it as a writing sample to the X Files, uh, but my one of my friends, Mark Kaufman at New Line, was like, "This is a movie, Jeffrey. Like, don't send this to like a TV show." Um, so I was like, "Okay." And so then I kind of worked it out as a feature idea, um, and so glad I did. <laughs> so glad I always, I always give Mark Kaufman a shout out too because he was. I, I suppose, other people may have told me, but I remember Mark being very like, very emphatic. Like, this is a movie, Jeffrey. <laughs> like, and I was like, cool, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Not only was it a movie, it was a goddamn franchise. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. It is funny because, um, and this, this is just coming from growing up as a fan and also working at New Line, which was a studio. So, of course, anytime they made a movie, they would, they were always thinking, can we make this a franchise? Because, that's what you ultimately want. You want the first one to be a success and have more. So when people ask me like, Oh, were you surprised, surprised that, you know, it was a franchise. I always plan, you know, just because all, even the movies I grew up, Nightmare on Elm Street were all Friday the 13th. Like all the movies had sequels. So, you know, most of the movies I write, you know, I don't write them in a way where it can't carry on somehow, but I didn't expect you know, I didn't expect like, you know, 20 odd years later. Oh, this feels so old. My mom lived to be 90. My mom lived to be 97. So, and she was really had her wits about her and, and was in good health and spirit. So I'm like, yeah, I'm only halfway through life. So quit worrying about it. But, um, <laughs> you know, you know, I, I, I certainly didn't expect like people to be talking about final destination moments. You know, like I'll, I'll mm-hmm. hear that. I'll be out with friends and I'll hear you know, we'll be out at a restaurant or a coffee shop. Well, not this last year, but yeah, <laughs> before yeah. this last year. Yeah. Um, you know, but you'd hear somebody being like, oh God, we had this total final destination moment. And I'm just like, hee hee. Um, so it's kind of cool. Like, yeah, you, you, ex- you hope that it has legs, but this, this one has kind of a special thing. You know, it's just, a, it's kind of part of the public lexicon in a way, you know, like, you know, we don't have the killer because death is our killer. So we don't have a Freddy or a Jason that you can, you know, make toys out of, which uh, is the one thing I'm I'm like, of course, I create a franchise that you can't like <laughs> bilk it for like Halloween costumes and masks and toys. But um, I think that's what makes 
the movies stand out more. It's like you're, you're not focused on death as a visual thing. You're focused on the concept of the movie that death is all around us and can get us. And um, yeah, it's just cool. Yeah, and having death as the antagonist, I mean, it's such an original idea, but I mean, you, you got a lot of pushback. Yeah, absolutely. No, because um, the studio was like, you know, the executive, which is, you know, you understand it. It's a bit, you know, making a movie is like expensive and a risky thing, but they're like, you know, you, you can't fight it if you, if you just make it, a, a, if you don't, if you don't manifest it as a, like a Grim Reaper or like some kind of, mo if you don't manifest it as a monster that people can fight, then that doesn't make any sense. Like it's a horror movie, you know, like, and we kept saying, you know, Craig Perry and Warren Zide were the uh, producers on this. And, um, you know, they kept, we kept going back and being like, that's the point, you know? And I remember there was, even, there was a draft of my script where at the very end, um, you know, clear kind of sees this like, manifestation of, of death appear for a moment, but she doesn't fight it. It just to kind of give them something. Um, but luckily when James Wong and Glenn Morgan came on board too, they're like, we're not showing death, you know, it's, you know, we're not going to create like a death monster. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's the reason that it, it's held up so well is because there's no like cultural or religious, depiction of death so no matter what you believe or don't believe or where, where you're from no matter what country you're from or anything like you can watch that movie and still enjoy it and you're not separated by oh this is like the grim reaper or this is like the devil in christian mythology or this is like you know something from a different culture you know it's it's just universal um so i think that's why the movie's held up as well as it has um or done as well as it has i guess internationally too um, it's been very interesting it does it does really well domestically but all this all the sequels have done like a little more than half the box office internationally so it's it's been nice to see it, it's like kind of gone beyond american culture and is like kind of embraced like another like you know i meet people from any any country i've ever meet people from like on a business point of view and they've all seen it like i've met people in china I don't think they sh the movies doesn't has never shown in China legally, but you know they <laughs> the people there you know they know how to get movies yeah. um, online <laughs> if they want. So there's like mm -hmm. you know like a, you know I've met people from China and they're like, yep, the movie never came out here, but we've it's got a huge following, <laughs> and it's like great. It's you know because that's what when you tell stories you want people to watch them and relate to them everywhere, you know. Yeah, I guess that that's another reason why it's been so successful because it is such a universal fear, this fear of death, and particularly, you know, a fear of inevitable death, this kind of ticking clock as well that you're going to die rather imminently. You know, it it yeah. scared the shit out of people what from whatever country they're from. <laughs> yeah. If I could come up with a good scary movie about the tax man, that would do really well here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, death and taxes are like the two big ones that the people mm -hmm. say you can't escape. And it's like, ah, there's only a way to the tax man. You All know? Right. So there's an, <laughs> this is horror exclusive. So Jeffrey Reddick <laughs> is working on the tax man. Or, so. or somebody or somebody just come up. Somebody just write that movie, please. Because, yeah, I've jokingly said because that's, you know, that's the old saying. So I'm like. I'm just surprised nobody's ever done a horror movie about the tax man. Yeah. You know. Uh, be, <laughs> I can hear it now. <laughs> the spring. April. <laughs> <laughs> no. That, no, that would be the name of the movie. April. Yeah. 15th. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Your taxes are due. Yeah. <laughs> that would be, that would be <laughs> He's coming to collect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody's going to write that now. It's going to be yeah. like a Kafka-esque surrealist horror. You don't die. You just fucking live. <laughs> you know? know. That's the and, horror. And you're in debt. You're in debt to the tax man forever. Yeah. Somebody can just write the movie. But yeah, that's my just, that's my freebie. If any, uh, if that inspires you got an anybody. iPhone, you can record in 4K. You oh, absolutely. 
you don't need and, and and plus i mean you know the budget's the government Fuck yeah it, you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so just make the movie give jeffrey reddick a producer role me and bob will take uh executive <laughs> producer role for facilitating the podcast <laughs> give us the money accordingly and there you go <laughs> There you we'll go. Pull all our refunds together and go, well, we did it ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like literally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe tactically for this movie that we're coming up with to do well and to add to the mythology, you could uh, deliberately not pay your taxes. And then a few years later, you know, your company goes under for not paying taxes. And <laughs> then the uh, film stocks and film sales rise. So mm -hmm. then we but, get taken to court because yeah. they knew we were going to do that and try to prove it. And that would be the sequel. Yeah. As, <laughs> you, <know>? as <laughs> you'd point out that uh, this is horror is not advising that people <laughs> don't do their taxes. So you can't sue yeah. us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to say one of the, to me, I think one of the clever things about Final Destination is the 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 premonition that, you know, the 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 knowing came from actually like to me it's like the first part of cheating the design is that's when you know, you know, yeah. and if you've never had a premonition before and you're a teenager and suddenly you have the strongest premonition that you've ever had, you don't even know what it is, but you just know that you have to get off that plane and you have to tell everyone and you don't care if they believe you or not. Yeah. To me, that's, that's a horrifying situation. Yeah. I would, if that happened to me, I would be scared to death, you know, yeah. and that's, that was prepared, per, you know, was portrayed very well in the film. And that's, yeah. I like that. Cause it's like, no, okay. Cause later you're like, that's, that's how he knew. Yeah. He De and Devin Sawa. I mean, you know, we've had a great cast for, for all the, the sequels, but, you know, for the first film, you know, I also wanted to subvert the genre a little bit and have a final guy, um, which yeah. we don't have a lot in films. And, and Devin Sawa, just, um, I'm friends with him today. He's just a wonderful person but, and so talented. And yeah, he just, yeah, he gave that role. He just, yeah, he was amazing in that role. Um, mm -hmm. The whole cast was great. But um, yeah, Devin, Devin's the one I've stayed in touch with. And he's just, you know, yeah, he just pulled that off. I mean, that's not an easy role to play. You know, it's I think the reason they don't have a lot of final guys in movies is because, you know, men are, you know, we're told in, you know, in our society that we're not supposed to show fear or mm -hmm. weak because it's I'm weakness. Live forever. Yeah. And I, yeah, yeah. I've got to be like Carter, the douchebag. The douche yeah. He's like, fuck everything. I'm never going to die. But, um, you know, I think um, Devin was able to just make that feel so real. Um and then it was just shot well. I mean, you know, James Wong is like a, a great director as well. And I think, yeah, it just all came together. Yeah, I, I, lo I love that opening scene. I, I, I'm partial to the part two just because, again, I grew up around the log trucks and there was a direct color, you know, because we were I had I had the idea for the sequel planned out, but I was dealing with Craig Perry, who's really like the godfather of this whole brand. He also was a producer on um, American Pie. So he's done like a seminal horror film and a seminal comedy franchise. Mm. And, um, but he's, he, he's always like pushing to elevate things. And, you know, we were struggling with the beginning of the opening scene and I originally was going to have it be kids going to spring break and, you know, they stay at a hotel and there's a fire and they get trapped and burned. And, um, he's like, yeah, it could work, but there's need something better. And I remember I was going home to Kentucky again and got behind one of those log trucks and like, pulled over and called him right away. And he's like, that's the opening. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's like one of those things where it's like, a, it, it was such an immediate kind of in the creative process. Like we'd already, you know, I'd already plotted out the basic story. It was just trying to figure out what that opening was going to be. And then um, David Ellis, who isn't with us any longer, unfortunately, like, you know, he was a stunt coordinator. Um, and, and so we just kind of let him go hog wild with that scene like we're like you just we you, we know that you're gonna make this scene look amazing so you just do it how you want to do it and i think he just delivered one of the one of my favorite openings of a, of a movie actually i just really love that opening mm -hmm. yeah and 
I'm wondering if you have an update on Final Destination 6. I mean, I guess with the pandemic, it's, it might be difficult mm -hmm. to say exactly when that's going to happen. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, I, you know, I've, you know, they were working on a story before, you know, and they, they had announced that they had hired, um, 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 I think it was Patrick and Martin or Marcus that were doing it. And if not, I'm really embarrassed just because I'm blanking. I'll blame it on COVID. But, you know, they, they, you know, they had a, a draft that, that they had written before COVID and then COVID hit. And so that's just put everything on hold. So I'm not sure what's you know when it's going to get picked back up again you know it's funny every time you know like when i saw final decision trending today i i sent it to the producer because i'm like you know hopefully the studio looks at this and <laughs> does something because it's one of the and it's it's not even selfishness as a as a creator on my part it's more as a horror fan where it's every other fr horror franchise that i know except for scream um and like i know we did there are, there are other examples but horror franchises where the sequels do really well, they keep making them. And this is, you know, so there's a part of me that's like, they've had like 20 Friday the 13th and, you know, 10, 15 Halloween movies. It's like, how come we've only had five Final Destination movies and people want them, you know, like, so there's a part of me that's just like, give the fans what they want and make another one. Um, but yeah, they're, they've, they were definitely planning on a 6-1. Um, and it's just... You know, I I don't know what's going to happen when things start picking up because there there were a lot of movies that were actually in production when COVID started that got put on hold and a lot of things that were further along, you know, than just the script phase. But you know, I know there's a demand out there for it. I know that you know, New Line slash Warner Brothers was wor was working on it, but it wasn't it hadn't gotten past the script phase. And um, I don't know, you know, like just being a writer myself, being in this business. I've had scripts where like production companies were like ready to green light it and then something happened. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, we're going in a different direction now. So I don't even know if the script that was written will be the script that they end up going with because things might change, have changed in this last year where somebody got a wild hair in their butt and they're like, let's do a, let's do a one about a virus. I don't know. You just never know. Yeah. So um, I'm sure, you know, there will be some update probably by the end of the year, you know, about if, if they're moving forward or, or how it's moving. Um, but I keep seeing like rumors online all the time and people who write me going, yeah, what, can I audition? I'm like, they don't, they haven't even, <laughs> they're not even near that point yet. Yeah. They're still at yeah. The, yeah they're not mm -hmm. even near. It. So, um, hopefully, you know, I'm, I'm just as hopeful as everybody else that there will be one coming out, you know, in the next year or so. Um, and again, the great thing is the fans keep asking for it. So that doesn't, that doesn't go unnoticed, um, you know, by the, by the studio too. So, yeah, so it's I just, mean... it's just when you're at a bigger, when you're at a bigger place now, like Warner, New Line's part of Warner Brothers. So when you're at a bigger company like that, you know, you have them dealing with all the DC property, you know, so they have all their big, big movies that they're focused on too. So, um, you know, when New Line was kind of independent, it was a lot easier for them to make you know, sequels. Um, but now that they're part of a bigger machine, um, yeah, there's just a lot more moving parts to getting something made, but, um, but there will be, a, there will be a part six for sure. I will say that much. I just don't, I just don't know when. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's it. And I mean, for fans of the franchise, keep getting it trending and keep talking oh, yeah. about it keep and people it. will notice. <laughs> yeah, they do. Uh -huh. They really do. Well, I thought of a better name for our tax movie. <laughs> I like oh. that we're immediately <laughs> jumping back into that. You know I mean, it, because, because it just, I mean, this is going to sell it. It's called Deadline. Oh. Oh. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's fucking done. <laughs> <laughs> the movie is there. The, just the title and it's about a tax man. Just yeah, give us the yeah. money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, Will you make the deadline? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, though, Bob, with your voice, you could say anything and it would sound <laughs> like a classic tagline. Like, if I yeah. say it, it doesn't really have the, the same ring. Oh, will you make the deadline? <laughs> 
<laughs> I know. <laughs> I just sound very unsure. Will he? Won't he? We'll never know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I grew up in that age of movie trailers, man. Just, you know, and now I get annoyed. You know, pop in a Blu-ray, I'm going to watch a movie, and, you know, after about the fifth preview, I'm like, oh, I've got a preview disc. Hmm. <laughs> you know, so. Oh. But, yeah, one of my friends does um, does movie trailer voices, which is cool. So when I had to put together, like, a little sizzle for, like, a job thing, I had him just do the, you know, when the student said blah, blah, blah. You know, it was fun. <laughs> the Don Fontaine, whatever his name is, Don Fontaine. Whenever the, the king of the movie trailers. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. Oh, uh, what's his name? Pablo uh, Francisco does him impersonation of him. But he does everybody. Oh. So, yeah, he does like the whole movie. So. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's, there's got to be a, there's probably a whole bunch of trailer guys out there. You know, there's probably like a little club of them. Um. <laughs> Where all their voices sound the same, and they can do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That could make an interesting comedy, like a you know, there's a convention of of, of movie trailer guys. Whoa, now, Bob, we've already <laughs> came up with uh-huh. a movie. Are we now coming up with a sitcom? <laughs> <laughs> no, that wouldn't even necessarily be a sitcom, but you know, that that could be something. But that's I don't know. That's when it's like you, you think of these ideas and then you 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 want to figure out how how I'm gonna, how am I going to present it you know and that's i don't know that's i guess that's one of the reasons um that writing appeals to me you know it's I, I, and i guess that's that's probably a good springboard a springboard point <clears throat> Is that, you know, because you you typically focus on, you know, the the visual, the the film aspect of it. But I know that you you write treatments. And so those are almost like a story. And maybe maybe there's a myth about that. But I mean, what what is a treatment? Um, It varies. In size, um, you know, I've read treatments that are four pages or five pages, um, and it, it it's basically just it lays out the movie. M- mine tend to be longer because, you know, again, this is kind of one of the habits I picked up working at Newline is you could you could sell a movie treatment back in the day, um, but you know you know you fleshed it out so like the you know it would have every scene in the movie written out, um, not in a ton of detail, but it would from opening scene to closing scene, you could read like, you know, like this 10 page document and basically know the whole movie from beginning to end. So it's almost like a short story version, but still told like cinematically. Um, But again, I've read treatments that are, you know, much shorter where they kind of skip over the, you know, kind of, you kind of come up with creative ways of if you need to make it shorter where it's like, you know, as her friends are, Perfectly murdered one by one. She has to do this and this and that. You know what I'm saying? So you don't have to get into every murder. Um, but I tend to be the kind of the way my brain works. If I'm especially if I'm pitching something, that's one of the things I always have to battle myself with is is trying to undo that. Where it's like when I'm pitching the movie, I don't have to have like every specific scene figured out. <laughs> um, I just have to have the story figured out and you know what the character wants, what the threat is, you know. If it's a obviously it's a horror film, like you know what the killer's mo is and what the killer's after and things like that. So, but but yeah, so a treatment is usually just a fleshed out outline of the movie. And it's it's I guess uh, the way that I, people have asked you know told me about it, uh, and this may be a good way you know for our listeners to 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 kind of get an idea of it. It's like because I, I I primarily write you know prose. So, you know, it's show, don't tell, but in a treatment, it's, it's like, you're actually doing the opposite of that. You're telling. Yes. You're, you're allowed to tell the story. Yes. And when you spent your entire life (laughs) writing the other way, 
you know, it, it's yeah. almost like, you know, we have to occasionally we have to write a synopsis and it's like, hey, yeah, I want I want to I want to look at how you don't write to see if I can, you know, decide if I want to read what you do write. <laughs> you know, and it's yeah. like, OK, yeah, yeah, fucked up, weird deal. But in movies, yeah. you can get away with it. Yeah, yeah, and it's 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 diff- it's so much different, or it's so much different, in because movies are all like about what you see through actions. But like, yeah, when you're writing books, you're not like you're in the characters' heads, so you get to have all the internal monologues and what they're thinking, and you really di- dive into that stuff, like what's going on inside the characters' heads. And then when you're writing a movie, you only you know you can only have snippets of you know you can't have them like giving long monologues about what they're thinking. So it's, it's, um, yeah, two different kinds of writing and they're both, um, well, I, I find prose writing more challenging for sure. I used to write short stories when I was young, but then once I got into the movie writing stuff, it's like, that's just how my brain, cause you know, I was, I was only 14. So, you know, my, my brain was still forming. So once it fully formed, it was like stuck in like treatment writing and script writing mode. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> writing prose like still like frightens me oh yeah and i mean i wanted to talk about your directorial debut don't look back and yeah i mean before that i know you've said before that obviously when you're the writer you have a little bit less control in terms of how it actually ends up looking on the screen in terms of that directorial uh, direction. So, I mean, was that a big factor in terms of becoming a director as well? It was a factor. It definitely was a factor, but it is funny because until you're actually directing a movie, you don't realize um, how much control you have, even as the director is contingent on so many other factors right um mainly budget <laughs> um uh so originally you know when we set up good samaritan we had it set up at a company and you know we had a five million dollar budget which is a you know a healthy size budget for a for a horror film um you know the blumhouse models are like five to seven and a lot of those take place in one house so we had a lot of locations which was kind of ambitious but when that company fell apart it became a situation where the producer and I were talking and it's like, we can either try to set this up somewhere else and go through this again, or we can just make the movie, but for a lot less. And, um, I was like, you know what, let's just make it because at this point, you know, I'd wanted to direct something before I hit 50 and I, you know, making a movie is no matter how many credits you have, um, is a hard endeavor. You know, it's hard, you know, because you never, you can get something greenlit and then the studio goes under, you can get independent financing, but something happens with the financing before it goes. So there, it's always a struggle to get a movie made. And we'd been trying to get this one going for several years and had many starts and stops. And so finally I'm like, let's just do it like, you know, indie budget. And, um, so it, it you know, it, it was, a great learning experience. And I'm, and I'm actually happy because a lot of my friends, you know, my director friends are like, once you do this, you're either never going to want to direct again or you'll want to direct again. And so I definitely want to direct again um, because you don't know what you don't know until you're, until you're doing it. And taking into account, like, you know, our limited budget, um, you know, I think, you know, I'm very happy with what, what we, we pulled off as the, in the film. Um, you know, strategically from a business point of view, I probably should have done a, one of my straight up horror scripts first. Um, because I know that's what people, you know, were expecting. And I know that they kind of marketed it like it was going to be a bloody kind of final destination movie, but because of the nature of the story where you don't know if it's a supernatural force killing them, you don't know if it's a killer killing them. Um, it's one of those movies where I couldn't show the, the actual murders you know, in the death scenes. So I knew going in that that was going to be an issue. Um, and with a $5 million budget, we had, we had some leeway to try to get some, you know, bigger names in the film, which would have helped, you know what I'm saying? Kind of bring people into it. Um, but I, you know, 
I know I'm, I'm very good. I've been in the business long enough to kind of look at stuff objectively and objectively. I'm, I'm really happy with the movie. I think it's very entertaining. Um, but I know most of the critique of it has been like, you know, it's not scary enough. It's not, a, you know, there's no, the horror scenes aren't, there's not enough horror in it. And I kind of had written this to be more of like a thriller um, and not a horror film. And I know when you start mixing genres a little bit, it's, you you know, this is the new line in me where, you know, they're like, unless you can nail all the, unless you have the resources to nail all the aspects of it, you should stick with the genre and not mix them. And this is kind of a mixture of a mystery, but potentially supernatural horror movie. So, um, so I knew, I knew it was going to, I knew that some people would not be ex- thrilled with it because they were expecting it. They were going to compare it to Final Destination inevitably. And I didn't, even though this is a setup about people, something happening to people that comes back to haunt them, it really isn't a Final Destination movie. I mean, there was a version of this movie I was going to do where it was straight up supernatural. Um, and I'm not giving any thing away by saying this is just you know i was going to do like a karma splattery version of this at first because i was like yeah i might as well if i'm you know i might as well hitch a train to my own wagon if i'm gonna if somebody's gonna rip off final destination i should just do it with karma right but, um but i wanted you know i wanted to kind of not do that and you know just tell a different kind of story so um so yeah, I'm really, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm really happy with how it turned out. Um, you know, we had a great cast and, um, you know, I, I, our leading lady, I think is just amazing. Um, and yeah, it's an, it's, it's, it's an indie film, but you know, we definitely put a lot of hard work into it and I'm, I'm, I'm happy with how it turned out. Like it's, but you know, there was an arrogance to, to me thinking, oh, if you're the director you control, you know, like what you, what you write on the page is going to end up on the screen. And it's like, that only happens if you have like the money to make it happen. Like when I read James Cameron's aliens script, like the movie that we see on the screen is exactly what you picture in your head when you're reading that script. Um, but that's also because he had a shit ton of money to like right. to make it happen. And so for, for our movie, it's like, you know, we did not have, the money to make stuff happen in the way that I'd written it. So then a lot of it was like, well, what can we, how can we still get this across and get this stuff across without having the, you know, the, the budget to like do these effects. And, you know, like the opening scene was originally a car crash, you know, where Caitlin's familial tr- trauma at the beginning of the film is her father dies in a car crash. Mm. And we got down to location scouting and we were looking at things and we're just like, we, you know, we can't pull this off and make it look good. So, you know, I literally had to rewrite that whole opening. Like, yeah. While yeah. we were filming, the, while we were shooting um, the film. So it's, it was, it was a really, it was a really great, like learning experience as well as just getting that first film direct, you know, getting it made and getting it out there experience as well. Um, so I think it was, it was a, I like to say it was a really, really good film school, you know, experience. Um, not that the quality is film school, but I'm just saying like, you know, again, we were just a lot of running and gunning um, and trying to make the most of what we had access to because we're like, you know, we can make the movie now or we can try for five more years to get a bigger budget and make it a different way. And I'm like, no, I, I, I want to, I need to direct. I need to do this. Like, I'm not going to, we had too many starts and stops before, so. Yeah, and sometimes your limitations can lead to a better result. And I mean, personally, I think Caitlin's father dying at, as he did in the opening scene is actually more effective than the car crash in the sense that there's just a greater juxtaposition between his death and then that kind of inciting incident that sets everything in motion. I mean, because there's Mm -hmm. so many similarities to it, whereas the car crash, I mean, yeah, she's experienced somebody die, but here she's like been in, in, in the midst of this, uh, 
violence and something yeah. very akin to what mm -hmm. she's witnessing in the park. Yeah, yeah. And that stuff, it, it is interesting because it's because when you're in the middle of it, it's like a tornado in a way because there's so much going on around you. And and I think it does it does work better. Just the funny thing is, like the, the house that I picked to shoot in was a very tiny house. It looked beautiful, but it was super tiny. Um, and they're originally only going to. There weren't going to be the scene that opening scene wasn't going to be shot there. So it was hard to like logistically like and it was also an, uh, one of those houses that was. um. I forgot, like a landmark house. So we couldn't like, we had to make sure we didn't damage anything or move stuff. Yeah. Um, so I was like, oh, this will be great for all the scenes, you know, after the car crash, because it just will look beautiful. But then it's like, oh, now we have to do this. You know, I'm trying not to spoil the opening, even though we kind of spoiled a part of it. Um, but yeah, it was like, we have to make all this stuff work in this like very small space. Um, but again, th what you learn later is like, the audience only knows what they see on screen. <laughs> like, so all the stuff in your brain that you're like, oh shit, we didn't, we couldn't do this and we couldn't do that. Like the audience doesn't know that. So the best advice I got was like, you know, there's the movie that you shoot. There's the, there's a script, you know, that you shoot. There's a movie that you edit. And then there's the final product when you've done all the post work on it. So it's like, there's three separate movies you have, you know, after yeah. the script phase. Um, and it was very fun to like work through that process and see where we change things in the editing, you know, because we didn't have like maybe all the coverage that we needed. We didn't have time to get it. So we were able to like do tricks in editing and take scenes from shots from other scenes and flip them and darken them and put them into other places. And there's just so much you can do. It's um, yeah, it's a, it's an amazing process. Like, um, I'd love to have like the final destination, you know, $40 million budget. Um, yeah, <laughs> that would be awesome. That would be awesome. Then I'd have lots of splattery stuff, but, um, but no, I, um, I'm, I'm proud of how the movie came, you know, how it turned out. And, um, I think as a filmmaker, that's, that's the goal is like, you know, to, is not because we we're our own worst critics. And I, so I think it's, if, if you're happy with it as a filmmaker, that's a win you know yeah and as you say i mean it was a great performance from courtney bell and yeah I, i'm wondering how, how did you come across her how did you end up working with her um it was interesting because when we when we had it at the production company you know they had actresses that that they wanted us to use but when we were doing it independently you know i i've been I've very much been trying to, to make sure to have diversity in my horror films, but it ends up usually not ever happening. Like even on the first final destination, I was like, just remember this is set in New York. Yeah. So New York's very diverse. And they're like, okay, we'll remember that. But they shot it in Canada. So uh -huh. then I saw the kids and I'm like, everybody's white in the movie. Like that, this doesn't feel like New York. Um, and it was the same thing with the second movie, you know, like I, I had written originally Kimberly to be, um, an African-American. Yeah. Um, and I tried with Tamara, you know, like, and I'm happy with how the movies turned out cause we ended up getting wonderful talent, but, um, you know, so since I had a lot more control with Good Samaritan, I'm like, I've just seen so many really strong black actresses come in and read and it's always for the best friend role. Like they never get offered the lead role. Um, and I'm like, I, you know, I want to find a black actress to play the lead in this film. And, um, you know, Courtney's tape came in and I liked it, but I actually went, I went online and she had a website up that had a bunch of shorts that she was in. Mm. And so I saw, I watched her shorts and I was like, she was so different in each one of them. And I was like, she's definitely got like all the elements of Kat Caitlin. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm like, so once I saw her, I was like, yep, yeah, this is Caitlin. And they were like, well, we should be, I'm like, nope, this is Caitlin. Um, it was the same thing with Will uh, Stout, who played Lucas, the brother. Like, I saw him pretty early on in the process, and um, I just knew that he was the actor. Um, and, you know, they kept being like, you got to see more people. I'm like, all right, if you're making me, but that's going to be who's going to be. <laughs> you know, like, um, I think I, I think having a background in, in just acting, it's 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 not. It's just like when when somebody when somebody is the character or, or, or you know that they 
have the qualities that you want in that character, like, you know, like when you see them. So those were the two. I mean, I, again, I love all of our cast, but those were the two I remember, like, just from right out of the gate when I saw them. Like, that's who's playing them. Yeah. They're like, we still have a, we still have a hundred other auditions for you. All right. But that's who's playing. Them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think that Will Stout was an excellent casting decision, and I can't really say mm-hmm. any more on that because it would be going into spoiler territory. So yeah. I suppose everyone yeah. listening, you now have to watch the film, and then you can yes. privately talk to me about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are, there are lots of potential. Yeah, everybody's a suspect if it's if it's a person, but there's also a good chance that it's not a person. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a what's, I, I, I said it's kind of a, it's not a who's doing it, it's a what's doing it kind of, you know, mystery movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like the ambiguity. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was fun to play with that, and it's, but again, it was also, it's tough because, you know, when you write straight up supernatural stuff, you have a creative bag of tricks that you can dive into. Um, yeah. And when you're writing something, you have to walk that fine line where there's, you know, this, I won't spoil like, but there's like one scene where I checked out the, um, the plausibility of something happening to a character that happens to them. And it could actually happen the way that it happens on screen. So, but it's a little bit of a cheat, but it's still physically possible. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the kind of stuff mm-hmm. I have to deal with. Mm-hmm. It's like, all right. Um, <laughs> like, um, and then there's like funny lessons I learned, like because we shot all the scenes with Courtney and her boyfriend. Uh, her name's Caitlin in the movie, but her boyfriend Josh, who was played by Skylar Hart, we shot all their scenes in the house during the same week mm. uh, because we had. And you know, you don't necessarily notice something when it's spread out over a script, but um, since we were shooting it back to back, I noticed in one scene he's cooking her breakfast, and then in another scene um, he's made dinner, and then in another scene I wrote he's bringing in Chinese takeout. And so when you have those scenes all back to back in the week, I'm like, oh, fuck, he's bringing her food like every time. (laughs) So I changed, you know, I changed I changed um, two of them. So he wasn't bringing her food Um, because, you you know, again, when it's spread out over a 90, 90 page script, you don't notice it, you know, that he's coming in with food. Um, But then when you're shooting all the scenes back to back, you're like, oh, that's. He's just bringing her a lot. He's just feeding her a lot. <laughs> like, yeah. He's just kind of a personal chef and food carrier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's dating him for the food. Because yeah. he's like, never eats. Well, you, you know, isn't the worst reason to date someone. I mean, you should probably have yeah. other reasons as well. But, yeah. you know, being a being good cook good. is... <laughs> yeah, that definitely is a bonus. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but I was going to say we, you know, even though our, our budget was limited, like we, you know, we did get to have like a rain machine, you know, for one of the scenes. And then we also worked with a crow, which is, you know, it's it is hard working with animals because they do what they want to do, <laughs> even if they're trained. Um, and so we had a crow in several scenes. And um, I just remember the one scene that we shot with the crow outside of a window. I'm just keeping everything kind of vague, but mm. um the crow wouldn't fly away and I was shooting it over the character's back. So I didn't notice it cause you're in, you're just in the moment when you're on set and we, we kept trying and trying and trying. And then it wasn't until I watched the feedback that I was like, Oh my God, I had those poor people standing in the window for like 40 minutes looking down, not moving. You know, you, you, you know, you always appreciate how hard your actors work, but it was an odd angle for them to have to stand in and standing there for 40 minutes, like with your head in the same position is not easy. <laughs> you know, um, It might sound easy, but it's physically not easy. Um, and everybody in the film was, they were just such troopers. Um, everybody about like, you know, any of the phys- physicality, physical stuff they had to do, makeup stuff, stunts, they were all just like all in. And um, it was, it was just a great team to work with. Oh yeah. And, I guess, I mean, you mentioned the crow, but just having a crow already gives it a horror feel. Like, you could put a crow in anything, and it's giving it a bit of a horror kind of taste. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
Yeah, and I was I was surprised because I was I was afraid the crow was going to have to go, and my producer Andrew Van Lenhout was like, "Nope, we're going to get you a crow." Yeah. <laughs> All right. Can we have the crow for three nights? Yep. Okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it must be kind of fun just uh, having to contact someone to have a crow for three nights, especially if they oh, yeah. didn't even know you were in the movie business. That'd be even more weird. <laughs> yeah, no, we we had to, we found a crow wrangler, but then you had to, yeah, we had to find a crow, the owner, and then we had to find a wrangler who was also available when we needed him to shoot because they're, you know, the, those people like book their animals out a lot, so. Um, yeah, it was it was it was definitely interesting, you know. Yeah, it's not as easy as you think. And oh, and then we had mice in another scene, um, and the mice actually, those mice were troopers. Like they did exactly, they hit their marks. They did exactly what they were supposed to do. Um, so the mice were the mice. I forgot about the mice. We had a crow ringer and mice, um, and the mice were cool because they just totally hit their marks. The, the mice get like the gold star for acting yeah um, <laughs> in, in the animal kingdom they get the gold star because they just did everything and that there's one scene where a mouse, mouse crawled on an actor's eyeball um and the, obviously the actor reacted but there's there was just enough of the shot that we could use in the movie bef- with the mouse going on the eyeball I'm like oh we got to keep the shot we got to keep that second in yeah it's just yeah it's just it's on his open eyeball come on yeah yeah happy accidents like that it's like you have to take <laughs> advantage of them yeah um, and that was a rather large crow or at least y'all made it look large i mean no, it, it initially a, yeah. i was like is that a raven but no i was like no that's a crow yeah. um and from what i've read that crows are easy to work with than ravens ravens are like full predator and <laughs> you know, was, i read something that's like they were they wanted to have raven ravens for a film and you know after like trying to, to get somebody to actually bring they're like well no we'll just use crows fuck that <laughs> yeah no these were they, and they were very they were very you know good but it's just it was funny like it's like we in the one scene that it, it just wouldn't fly it just would not fly off and then in the other there's another scene where we needed it to fly towards a camera and oh we had it for four nights there was actually a, but um and that took forever yeah it's just getting them to like land where you want them to and then move um it can be very complicated um and then it gets to the point where your ad and your dp are like uh, we're just going to use what we have and i'm like just one more try you know because you want to get it perfect um mm-hmm. but yeah but it's you know again like it the movie does what i kind of set out to do which was that you know i hopefully tell like again a kind of a universal story about like to get people thinking like what would i do like i don't you know i never expect people to like throw themselves into harm's way um so but you know filming something and not calling the police or running off and not even saying stop you know what i'm saying um you know i wanted to give the characters different kind of degrees of guilt you know because it's that was a tough thing too it's like you couldn't have a scene where you know because it does center around a person who gets assaulted in a park and these people don't help um and don't intervene but you know there was a lot of discussion about like well we we don't want the assailant to be too big because if he's too imposing, then obviously the audience are going to be like, well, I wouldn't have done anything. And you don't want it to be like yelling at people because nobody like physically jumped the guy to try to stop him. So we had to kind of make it clear. Like these people were like either consciously choosing not to help or again, just filming it, you know, except for Courtney who was kind of held back because of her trauma or Caitlin, um, you know, her character was, you know, having PS or post-traumatic stress because of, you know, what she had experienced earlier. So she was frozen for a reason. And then she finally did help, but it was too late. So, you know, you always have that, the one character who's like the, the most innocent, I guess, who you have to have for your lead. So the audience is kind of following their journey. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah. yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was just like, again, it's, it's my first one and it was, it was just, it was a lot of fun to do. And, 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 um, 
you know, we've gotten a good response. I mean, you know, honestly, like I said, they're the horror fans, a lot of the hard, the, you know, the more hardcore horror places, you know, have been tougher on it because they they all compare it to Final Destination and they're like, you know, there were such good bloody set pieces in that one and, you know, there aren't any in this and it's like, that's because it's a different movie. But, yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But, um... Armchair critics, yeah. Yeah, and and that's... <laughs> and, and, I, and I... Critic... Criticisms that are valid, I completely mm-hmm. absorb because... The same way with my writing, like, you know, my goal is to always get better. Um, and I don't expect that anything I write or, you know, anything I direct is going to be perfect. So valid criticisms, you know, I've read some really valid stuff and that I've absorbed and stuff that I knew even going in. It's like, oh, we didn't get what we needed here, you know, so we'll try to do what we can in post. But, you know, so there, there are definitely things that I that I do pick up from from, you know, reading critical stuff. Um, because I think it, it's like, oh, this is a good thing to keep in mind because, you know, when I do my next thing, um, but yeah, there, there are just some critics that are just me, like, like there's a, this Roger Moore website and, you know, he like, you know, ravaged the film, but then I, I read a lot of his reviews and it seems like he hates it. And maybe I don't read every one of them, but I, most of the horror ones that I read of his are just. I'm not trying to call him out. I'm just, it just seems like he, there are some reviewers that get really just, he, he's not one, there were some really mean reviewers, which kind of cracked me up. There was one guy that hated it. He did a whole YouTube, but for 25, because he starts off his review by, by saying he didn't want to waste his time reviewing this piece of trash because it was so mm. bad. But then he spent like 25 <laughs> minutes, yeah. like just ranting. And I was like, I was like laughing because I'm like, wow. He hated this movie. And then I have other reviews where they loved it, you know, and that's the great thing about mm-hmm. making, yeah. making a film. It's like, you're going to, you're going to find people who like it. Um, and you're going to find people who, who don't like it, you know? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and I think another thing working at new line, you know, I always try to throw these like little tidbits of advice out when I'm talking, but the one thing I one another good lesson I learned from new line is, because I got to see how they made movies behind the scenes. I found out very early on that uh, the studios don't, it's not like they pick, you know, if they don't pick one script over other, it doesn't mean that the script they picked is better because there were so many times where a really great script would come in to the studio that was from an unknown writer. And then we'd get a really shitty, and I'm just saying Jim Carrey because people know him. I'm not talking about a specific movie, but just cause he's a big guy, but we get a very shitty script. with somebody like Jim Carrey attached. And of course they're going to make the Jim Carrey movie because it's Jim Carrey. You know what I'm saying? So, um, so I learned very early on to always be open to like constructive criticism, but also not to put myself worth. Like, you know, if a place passes on a script, like I'm not like, Oh my God, you know, it's because my script sucks or I suck or anything like that. And I think a lot of artists and writers do that, you know, like I, even a lot of my writer friends who've been around, if every time a script gets passed on, they, they go into a spiral about, you know, did I make the wrong choice in life? And it's like, it's, there's so many other, dis- there's so many things outside of your, it's like acting, you know, that's the one thing, like if I act anymore, I'm just going to put myself on my own movies. Cause I could not go through the audition process, you know, as a director, when you get down to like, two people for a role and you like them both and but you've got to decide because one of them has either a little different kind of chemistry with the person they're with that you want or one of the actors looks like one of the other actors so much that if you cast them both you know what i'm saying it's just, they're going to look like brothers yeah you know there's so many so many things that come into play or a producer will have you know like okay well you got to pick these actors but we're pushing this actor or this actress um, so there's so many things that are outside of the actor's control that, you know, that, that process, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I'm not involved in that anymore. <laughs> like, cause even just on the producing and writing side, it, it's, it's nerve wracking for me. Cause I can't help even, even when we get to like our top, like three or five, I start feeling bad for, because I like, I don't, I know only one of them is going to come through. Um, and so I just start feeling bad because I'm like, four of these people have their hopes up and aren't going to get this part, you know, and the fifth person is going to get it. And 
I just don't, you know, I just like, uh, I, I hate to be an actor or actress in that position. Um, but you have to do it. You know, that's how you, you keep putting yourself out there and that's how you get work. And, you know, with Courtney, I mean, I really liked her audition, but me going on her website and seeing her shorts, if she hadn't done that, I'm, you never know if I, you know what I'm saying? But because her tape came in with some other tapes, but I went to her website and um, I saw her shorts and I'm like, oh, this is, she's, she's it, you know, because I, again, I saw from every short, like she had all the aspects of Caitlin that I wanted. Um, and in an audition, you, you know, you, you have a couple of scenes, but she did went that extra mile and had her website put up for herself where you could see her other work. And, um, you know, that really helped her, you know, in this particular situation. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's a good lesson for any actors listening, you know, do as much as you can to give yourself that advantage. If you've got a diverse portfolio of shorts and reels, then put them up on your website, make yourself easily Google. Google-able. Yeah, I was thinking, I was trying to say it, and then I was like, wait, have I ever said that out loud? I don't, <laughs> it's not a word, but I knew where, I knew where you were going. Yeah. It, so. <laughs> Make yourself easy to Google. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> Good point that I completely butchered with pronunciation. No, you, you, just, you, just made up, you just made up a new word. Yeah, that's why I haven't said it before, because it's not a fucking <laughs> word. <laughs> but moving on from me trying to invent words, like I think I'm the British Shakespeare or something. In fact, he was British. So yeah, the longer this goes on, the more shit I'm talking. <laughs> but I mean, as will be no surprise to fans of your work in Don't Look Back, there's an awful lot of social commentary and questions of morality that are raised, you know, in, in watching the film. So, I mean, one of which is, of course, at the forefront is about in, in standing by and being inactive when there is violence occurring, in what degree does that make you complicit? Because, of course, there are, are reasons that people are going to have, like Caitlin. I guess in America as well, there is that fear that the you know, attacker could have a gun. In the UK, they could have a knife. So, you know, there's all sorts of questions. But, I mean, you know, you, you can see perhaps not stepping in and getting violent with the assailant but then when when you're starting to film rather than make a phone call to the emergency services i mean you've got to think we might well be losing empathy in place of wanting internet fame yeah and that was um that was a key thing that has actually just gotten worse over the years since I even wrote this is, you know, for me, the movie is about the fact that we've lot, we've started losing empathy for each other. And, you know, what happens at the park is a symptom of that, but it's also what happens to the Samaritans, the quote unquote bad Samaritans, you know, where the public starts ostracizing them um, and judging them without knowing them. Um, so they have no empathy. The public has no empathy for them. Um, we see different characters, you know, had some empathy or maybe we're coming from a place of fear. Uh, but it, yeah, it was kind of the general lack of empathy that, you know, again, this is the highfalutin <laughs> thing, but it's just like people's lack of empathy for each other, which I think is got getting worse and worse. Um, almost every year now it just seems like we we've gotten so polarized that we just don't even try to empathize with anybody that doesn't think like we do or look like we do or act like we do and um that's that's really what this kind of story that's kind of the heart of the story is like and then and i'm gonna say this without hopefully spoil anything but then you know i wanted to raise a question at the end of the movie um about misplaced empathy you know what mm -hmm. i'm saying like if yeah. you know what i'm saying like like what if we have empathy mm -hmm. and you know what i'm saying like um 
and that was done intentionally as well because I wanted people to go back and just re rethink, you know, how just rethink things like, OK, well, if, you know, once the whole puzzle's put together, like, does that, you know, how does that, does that change, change how you feel? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. So, yeah, that's what this story, uh, you know, like if Final Destination is about morality or mortality. Um, this one, I think, is the heart of it is about like empathy for people. And then also, yes, you know, does, you know, you don't have to be an active participant in something bad happening. But if you if you just kind of walk on by, you know, a situation and don't even try to help or try to do something to. To stop it, like how guilty are, are we, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I know exactly the scene you're referring to about the misplaced empathy. And it's, uh -huh. that's a brutal scene on so many levels, kind of seeing realization <laughs> as to the misplaced oh, yeah. empathy. And uh, particularly given the situation of the person realizing that. And yeah, that uh -huh. was incredibly well done and mm -hmm. again for fear of spoilers i cannot say more right. than that but that was a particular standout i think of the entire film yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's one of one of my one of my favorite scenes um yeah. just because again it's it's um and I, again i'm not trying to go back to reviews but i know some reviews were like oh you know there was a tacked on ending to try to be a, a a twist or something like that. And it's like, it wasn't tacked on at all. Like it was very purposeful. <laughs> like what I was, you know, like, I don't, I don't understand what you're saying, but that's okay. People don't. And, yeah. At that point, yeah, I was at the question, did you, did you watch the movie? Yeah. I mean, because like not spoil anything, but it's not tacked on. Yeah. <laughs> it's like pretty much like a thread going through the whole right. thing. Yeah. 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 If you watch closely enough, it's clearly choreographed. Yeah. That's it. I'm going to start critiquing the critiquers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. That's a new podcast. Now Now you've created a couple of Critiquing the critiquers. And a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows who my next victim's going to be? Yeah. <laughs> this guy did a 25 minute video of a movie he didn't like. So now we're going to go ahead and shame him and tell him how movies are actually made. <laughs> 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 I don't know. They call, and it, people would say, oh, yeah, that podcast, Bob's a dick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the, that's the name of your podcast, Bob's a dick. <laughs> With a yes. You have to add the yes on yourself. <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm really not, but I mean, it, it, it's, I, I know what you're talking about. It, it, and to hear the people say that in a critique, it's, uh, you're almost going to go, D did we watch the same thing? Well, we I, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know. I don't think, a, I mean, I'm, I think a lot of, I think I shouldn't say a lot. I'm, I, there are definitely reviewers because I'm, Especially with horror films, like I, I do read reviews, um, not just of mine, but just horror films coming out. And I've read some reviews where they've just missed, like, and I know they're probably scribbling notes as they're writing, so things can get lost in translation. But they'll say something happened in the movie that completely didn't happen. They're like, and then, you know, the, the guy's sister gets killed. I'm like, the guy didn't have a sister. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Where it's such a glaring like thing, like you're. Did you actually watch this movie, or did you just like skim through it? You know. Yeah, and 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 um, I, I, a matter of fact, I can't remember the name of the movie, and I can't remember who did it, but I'm pretty sure a big time reviewer actually did that, and someone called them out on it, and they end up pulling their review. And this happened like maybe within the last two years. It and might. I think that reviewer lost their job. Oh wow! Of it. Yeah. Because basically they phoned the the review in, <laughs> you know. Which I mean, to me, if you're going to be a reviewer and they're paying you for the, you know, for the copy, then you kind of need to do the do job. Do your job, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And that that's what cracks me up with some of the reviews because it's I don't mind because I can understand if somebody gets a little thing confused, but there's some reviews where I read where it's like they'll they'll say that there was a scene that wasn't even in the movie. But it's not like, oh, maybe they got a 
a different version of the movie. It's like, that wasn't even in here. It's like, and then when that alien showed up, you know, <laughs> and impregnated the dog, and you're like, there was no alien, and there wasn't a dog in the movie. It was a cat movie. Yeah. Um, it's like, I don't know what you were ingesting while you were watching yeah. the movie, but it sounds like you had a really good evening. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you should have started this review as, well, the first thing we did was eat mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> Then things got a little surreal from there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we love how the director was able to make the colors of the movie spill out into our living room and swirl around our heads. It was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's how mushrooms work, but it just seems like it seems like that would happen if you were on mushrooms. <laughs> and see, that, that's how that's how the the movie seemed to make it work. Yeah, yeah. that's that's where I'm getting I all my mushroom advice it. from. Is yeah, from from watching watching the movies. Um, and I, I remember that um that um that little film where they tried to mit, reefer madness, where like yeah, if you smoke oh, pot, yeah. you you go crazy and jump out a window and kill yourself. So I know that that's how pot works. And I think storks bring babies. If I'm not mistaken, that's where babies come from is storks. And yep, I'm very smart. Take all of my advice that I've been giving. Because <laughs> I am clearly so worldly. <laughs> yeah, you are spitting truth on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, <slinking them. laughs> so, I mean, someone who we haven't mentioned who has a... A smaller part in the movie is, of course, Rain Wilson. Yes, I he's a I adore Rain. He's um he's a friend of mine. Um, you know, I met him through church. We're both Baha'is, and um, I met him years ago. And I've always loved his work. Um, he's just a phenomenal actor, but he's also just a phenomenal man. And mm. um, I I had directed a short called Good Samaritan, but. If, and it's a, you can watch it online. And it's it's fun, and there's I'll tell a story about that. But um, I basically took a character who's in the feature and created a story around him that was totally supernatural because I wanted to show people I could direct horror. Um, so the short is not indicative of the feature, even though there's crossover with the characters. Um, but you know, I got Rain to be in the short. Um, and he's in it a lot longer um, in the, in, than he is in the feature. And I also, and this is my second favorite thing in the world, is um, I got Jane Badler, who played the original Diana in the V miniseries and series, um, to do a cameo. And Nightmare on Elm Street's like my favorite movie of all time. And the V miniseries is probably my favorite <laughs> TV event of all time. So I have been like... A, crazy mad fan of Jane Badler's forever and um, reached out to her. I think it was on Twitter to be honest <laughs> and just said I was a fan and would wanted her to be in, you know, in my short and I could pay her. Um, but she's in Australia mm. and she's like, I'll, I'll gladly do it. Um, I'm just in Australia. So you'll have to have somebody film me here. Um, and she was so lovely. Like she's, she only has a line in the short. And it's a very Diana line from V. Um, but when I got the footage back, she had she did like six costume changes. She went to like 15 locations. Like, you know, normally, especially if you're not paying an, an actress. And I shouldn't, I, I probably shouldn't have said I didn't pay her. <laughs> no, I did. I think I had to pay her guild, the guild minute. Or you know what I'm saying? Like, because it was a guild short. So I had to pay her. Mm -hmm. But she wasn't going to charge me like anything extra. Um, but you know, normally if you did that, somebody might go out and, you know, do like two takes, you know, or maybe three or four takes if it's one line, but she was like, I wasn't sure what background you want. So, she, and I'm like, so I met her when she came to LA for coffee and, um, I've never been starstruck in my life. And I've met like, when I worked at New Line, I met like a lot, you know, Morgan Freeman, Brad Pitt, you know, mm. Cameron Diaz, you know. I've met a lot of big name people and I've certainly admired them. You know, like when I met Morgan Freeman, I was like, holy shit, it's Morgan Freeman. This is awesome. <laughs> um, and when I met Wet Miss, when I met Wes Craven, I was the same way, like in Heather Langenkamp and Robert England. Like, I'm like, holy, you know, but st Starstruck, apparently, which I never knew what it was, is 
like when you're literally there and then you can't talk like you're you just your brain short circuits for some reason so we met at the chateau Montmartre for like lunch and i sat down and i literally couldn't speak and i was just looking at her and she was smiling and and it took me like probably 15 to 20 seconds before I could even start talking. And then I finally was like, this is embarrassing. It's never happened. I said, I'm literally starstruck right now. So <laughs> please forgive me. And she, she's just a lovely, we're friends now and I adore her. But, um, that was the first time I've ever been starstruck in my life. Cause you know, when I was introduced to Morgan Freeman, I, yeah, of course in my brain, I'm, I'm going, Holy shit, this is Morgan Freeman. But I was like, Hey, Mr. Freeman, great to meet you. Met her. Couldn't talk. <laughs> I was like, so ridiculous. So, um, oh, I'm. T this is a long ass. I, I just realized I'm talking as I'm thinking right now. Oh, no, so, so oh, good. Tangent. I mean, you, but, you, but you mentioned it back that you, to rain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tying it back to rain. Um, you know, I I wanted to use his his because he plays the same character in the feature, um, but we couldn't shoot him because he was working. And I wanted to use his footage from the short, and he was gracious enough to let us to do that. So um, the the you know, only thing is obviously is a professional courtesy. Like, you know, we didn't want to put his name on the poster because, you know, he he's got a much bigger part in the short, but it's a you know he's a newscaster in the feature that shows up a couple of times. But you know, obviously, we're not going to stick his name on the poster, so people think they're going to be seeing a Rain Wilson movie. Um, so that was kind of like a it's not an Easter egg if you go on IMDb because um, we finally put him up there, but it was just something like I just because I adore him. I just wanted to, to have his footage in the film and um, but not exploit it like most people would try to do and be like starring Courtney Bell and Rain Wilson. And you're like, what? Where, where? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You do sometimes see that with movies. You know, there's like a cameo where Johnny Depp has a a line and then you see in like the low budget version he's on the front cover <laughs> yeah yeah so um so yeah it was really it was awesome to to have him in the film and uh, uh he's just such a good actor i just saw that movie he did where he plays a security guard that um gets trapped in a i forget the name of the movie um where he falls into a hole when he's chasing these two kids and it's it's um who are robbing a house and it's just a such a great movie. Uh, anyway, I'm good. I'm going off on tangents now. Um, but yeah, Rain Wilson had a had a had a cameo, and um, I did the paramedic voice um, in a scene where the paramedics arrive to help somebody, and and the person is fading out, <laughs> and you hear the paramedic going, "We got it. We got a pulse. She's coming back." That was me. That was yeah. my. That was my. Because um yeah, my friends asked me because I've done cameos and most of my films um and my friends are like do you want to do a cameo in this one i'm like no it just feels weird like i'm directing this one i don't want to do a cameo but i my sister um and the producer andrew van and sister um there was a longer shot of them we had to put the shot into a montage but there's this shot where caitlin goes back to visit the um memorial for the victim in the park and there are these two women on a bench filming her and that's my sister and the producer's sister. So that was fun. Yeah. You know, that's it. Making movies like it should be fun. It's hard work, but you know, I got the name of some characters after my friends and you know, so, you know, that's kind of what, why I enjoy movies too. It's like, I I'm focused still on the story, but you know, it's, it's always, you know, like one, one of my most, the sweetest friends in the, in the world that I have that I've known since college, like the nicest guy in the world. And it's like, I named the, you know, the guy who in the movie they describe as like a drug addict and a killer. It's, yeah, his name is Bart Gaddis. He's a drug addict and a this and a that. And it's it's just fun, you know. Yeah. Um, well, if you can't have fun doing that, I mean, and it's your passion, then what else are you going to do? I know. You know, I know. that's, you know, it's, it's work. You know, I mean, I, I, I recently finished the first draft of, of a of a hopefully what will be a novel uh, i tend to oh, like awesome. write massive fucking outlines and then have to add shit to it but uh that's that's my mo but you know and i had a good time but man that that last pull i was actually on vacation 
and I wrote every day. And I'm going to tell you right now, it was hard. Yeah. It was hard, but I was like, I'm determined. I'm like, I'm going to finish it this week. And that's pretty much all I did. I didn't do anything else. I mean, it's like I waited until like the very next day to even go out and get Resident Evil Village. So I, I treated <laughs> myself. You know, You're like you don't understand how hard I here's how hard I work, Jeffrey. Yeah, I, I work waited. that fucking hard. That's <laughs> awesome. Congratulations. But, That's oh well yeah. thank you. But you know it's it's work, but I mean here's the thing. It, it's when it's your passion, it's fun. So why not have fun doing your passion at work? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because there's a lot of jobs that are hard work that that you just don't enjoy. So it's like, if I'm gonna, you know, if I'm not, if I'm gonna be doing hard work, like let it be at something I like doing. Um, uh huh. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's why we're crazy artists. Right. Right. <laughs> or crazy fans, or crazy whatever. Crazy in a good way. But you mentioned being a member of the Baha'i Faith, so I'm wondering. I mean. How does that play into your life? Um, it's been, I mean, it's, you know, it's been very integral to the, to my life. I mean, you know, kind of the, kind of the core message, our belief system that we have is that the oneness of humanity. So we believe that all the world religions are kind of part of a progressive revelation that as society changes, God sends different manifestations down to teach lessons. And so we believe that kind of all the world religions are part of like just one religion, we, like one God, you know, and it's very centered around social equality, like equality of men and women, um, equality of the races. And, you know, this, you know, this is a religion that it's about 150 years old and it started in, in Persia. So, you don't, you know, you don't expect something coming out of the Middle East 150 years ago to be talking about men and women being equal, um, education being, you know, you know, the need for like universal education, the, the need for like, um, equality of the races. Um, and, you know, again, the quality of religion basically, and that's things like science and religion can't be in conflict. So, um, being brought up in that, with that belief system while growing up in a place that was pretty racist and very fundamentalist Christian. Like if you didn't believe that Jesus was the only way to heaven, you were going to burn in hell. <laughs> um, like I was that annoying kid in school where I, and I, and I wasn't, it wasn't even the, maybe it wasn't even because I was a Baha'i I was asking these questions. I think it was more because I've always, I don't take things at face value. <laughs> like um, they have to make sense to me. So I'd be like, so what happens if, it, you know, there's a, you know, they just discovered this tribe in Africa. Like if, what if they've never heard of Jesus? So are they're going to go to hell? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And they're like, well, when the rapture comes, they'll have a chance to accept Jesus. And I'm like, but if they've lived their whole life and they've never heard of Jesus, so somebody's just going to show up and say, hey, you're in the rapture. Do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? They're supposed to just say yes. And if they don't, they're going to go to hell. Well, yeah. And I'm like, that doesn't make any, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, they didn't, they didn't mm -hmm. like it much because I was asking questions like that. But, um, but I think that, you know, it, it, it helped me see people as people. Um, and, you know, also one of the key tenets is eliminating, you know, extremes of pro po poverty and wealth, you know, cause I grew up in a very poor area and there's a, there's almost a, you know, like I just use Kentucky as an example because Mitch McConnell is just a fucking shithead piece of shit. I can't even say enough shits how much. And the reason I say that, the reason I say that is because as powerful and as wealthy as he is, Kentucky has been for poverty. It's one of the highest states in the country for poor health care. It's one of the highest states in the country. And obviously politicians should be making life easier for their, for those people. And they don't, they keep people in this kind of cycle of, you know, like we had a coal mine in our town that shut down before I was born. And, you know, people had black lung and everybody up until even now are still saying coal's coming back. And it's like, it's not coming back. And it's not because the government doesn't is trying to keep coal down. 
the coal mine took all the coal out of this county and fucking left. And they didn't train you all to, you know, for any kind of other jobs. They didn't do anything about your black lung and all the health. Like, you know, so we have this cycle where people get so caught up in, and this is even a religion, this is more a social thing. It's like people get so caught up in like what we're brought up to knee jerk say about things that we're not solving any of the problems. And that's what bugs me about like kind of the poverty. Like I'll, you know, I have family, you know, and we were on food stamps when, you know, when we were young, cause we needed it. We weren't abusing it. And I have family that's on food stamps, but they're like, you know, and this is all my, my white family in Kentucky, but I would grow up listening to them going, well, you know, they should cut back on food stamps because, you know, those welfare queens are, you know, going out and buying TVs with it. And I'm like, you're on food stamps. Like, why would you cut a program that you need, that you viably need to support your family? Why would you want them to cut it because you think somebody else is taking advantage of it? Like, that's the kind of, you know, humans have a thing where we'll cut off our nose to spite our faces sometimes. And I think that's the thing that always irks me the most about like a lot of our societal problems is the people in power have a way of keeping us arguing about something over in left field when the problem is in right field and nobody's dealing with the actual problem you know um i just went off on a tangent there sorry i'm avoiding saying trump's name so we're all good so i won't i won't be saying anything about him being a dickhead um but Back to how that influenced me, I think as a writer, you know, I, you know, I've never written like gratuitous, you know, s- sex or women being assaulted or women being like lesser than men in my work. Like, I think I've always written strong female characters. Um, you know, again, I've tried to have racial diversity in my work and that's never kind of come across. Um, Good Samaritan is the only project where I've where I specified, you know, made faith a specificity. Mm. Um, and, you know, Chris, you know, Caitlin is a, is a Christian. Um, but I also, karma is at play here, which is a Middle Eastern belief. So that's, that's kind of me mixing spirituality, you know, pa- two different spirituality paths in the same film. Because to me, it, they all stem from the same thing, you know, trying to find a higher power, trying to, you know, find a higher purpose. Um, so that, I think that was my subtle way of, of doing that. Cause a lot of, a lot of people when we were shooting were like, Oh, this is a faith-based film. You know, they thought it was like a Christian faith-based film and it's not, you know, I, I, I had, I didn't realize how much faith was in it until I was shooting it. And I was like, Oh yeah, there's a lot more. <laughs> it looks, it's pretty heavy on that, but you know, karma's in there as well, which again is not part of the, kind of Christian belief system um, because karma is dictated by like the universe and your actions coming back on you as opposed to like a God or a devil, like punishing you or rewarding you. So um, yeah, I think, I think, I think it just affected, you know, how I view women. Um, Cause again, I just grew up think- thinking women were, were equal, even though they weren't being treated as equal. Um, you know, I grew up believing that all races were equal, even though that wasn't the reality that I was seeing around me. Um, so it's, it's just informed how I move through the world, I think. And it, it does inform my work. Um, but like I said, mostly it's, I think it's because, you know, this was so funny because, um, Pierce Morgan, um, he, he made some kind of, and I try not to get into it with anybody on Twitter, but he made some kind of stupid tweet about one of Gillette's ads, Mm -hmm. you know, um, about, I don't know about the masculine, something about masculine or something like that. And I tweeted to him about, and with a comment. So he tweets back to me and says, Oh, the guy who writes movies about women getting naked and butchered is going to get, you know, but he kind of did something like that. And so I responded, I'm like, none, you know, I didn't write Fondle Ascension three. Yes. It's got naked ladies in a tanning bed dancing with, no tops on and bouncer and tits around for five minutes, which I don't get. Um, I don't, I don't know why. I mean, I know why they did it for, for t- teenage boys, but I don't know what it's, but none of my movies have had like gratuitous nudity or women getting like raped or anything like that. Cause I just respect women too much. And, um, and so that turned like entertainment weekly picked that up and it was like, 
Jeffrey Reddick schools Piers Morgan. And I was like, yay, Piers Morgan. I mean, that guy will pick a fight with anybody that he. Oh, yeah. He's, he's, he's kind like of like the most um, uninformed person of his stature <laughs> that's ever existed on the planet. Yes. Like uninformed. It's like, fuck, do you even read? I know. I, and I'm. I didn't know you did that, and I'm pumped because I hate that fucker. Well, it's – yeah, I'm sure you guys in, in London don't love him either. Yeah, that, that's um, what I was going to say. It sounds like um, he's as loved internationally as he is in the UK from the sounds of what you're both saying. Well, you know, there are people – there are people – and this is fine because that's their brand. Is There are people who just like to stir up trouble to stay – in the news and a lot of these like pundits you know they all are selling books you know like the, the people who get on there and tweet the most outrageous stuff that they know is going to get people upset you know they're doing it on purpose and then you go to their profile and it's like i have a book coming out next month it's like they're just doing yeah. candace owens the same way you know and and you know yeah. they will just you know to tommy larmer and you know there's i know there's leftist people on the left out there that do that shit. you know they just you know, they've got something to sell, so they'll just pick a fight with anybody. And I guess if they see a blue check by your name, they think you have followers. So they may, they, they're going to call you out because maybe that'll get you more attention. But, um, <laughs> um, I'm just, I feel like I'm devolved. I feel like I'm devolving now in the conversation. <laughs> you're like, you're like, what do you, what do you think about this? And I'm like, well, rabbits are fuzzy. Um, <laughs> I think I'm still, yeah, no, I haven't gotten too far off point. I, sometimes I ramble because I don't, you know, obviously with COVID, I don't, I haven't been hanging out with a lot of people. So, um, if yeah. I, if, if I start rambling off topic, you can just kind of gently nudge me back. And, yeah, Jeff, remember we were talking about how this happened in your movie and now we're talking about Martians. Oh, okay. Yeah. Back to the movie. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't happen often, but I think, you know, there's always room for a fuck Piers Morgan tan <laughs> tangent, you know, to occur midway through yeah. an answer. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You just got to put that in there. Yeah. <laughs> well, switching gears, I wonder what should you be kinder to yourself about? Um, that's, the reason that's a funny question is I, I've, I've, I've been practicing that for a long time. I've been sober and um, I quit drinking, um, 14 years ago. So, um, I've worked through a lot of my shit. <laughs> I certainly haven't worked through all of it, but I've worked through a lot of my stuff. And, um, I think I go, pr I think I, I don't think I'm too hard on myself. Cause that's one of the things I had to work on early on. I think probably this isn't, well, I get, maybe this is being kind of myself. I tend to put other people's needs and health above my own. So I will try, like, I'm a typical cancer where like, I feel like I have to be like for Florence Nightingale and save the world. So I will try to help everybody else around me and kind of take their problems on and start stressing myself out about their problems and then forget about myself, you know, and be like, Oh, you know, like if I'm stressed out and I'm worried and I'm not, you know, eating right, I'm not going to be able to help my friends because I'm not going to be in any condition to help them. So I think, I, I guess that's, yes, self, I should go easier on myself or I should just keep self-care at the top of my, my list. I think we all should. I mean, that's, I think that's a lesson that we all need to learn is, is obviously if we, if we're not taking care of ourselves, no matter how much we're trying to help other people, we're not being as, you know, we're not being of service as much as we could be as if we were completely healthy ourselves. So, um, I have a self deprecating sense of humor that I wish I didn't have. My friends always call me out on that. Like, um, a sense of humor is fine, but I, I'm a lot of my jokes. I'm always putting myself down. So maybe I should quit doing that. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I guess it depends on the context. I mean, in, the UK, basically a good sense of humor is self-deprecating. I suppose it becomes problematic if it's bleeding into actual truth and self-doubt about yourself. You know, if it if yeah. it goes from humor to actual self-hatred, then yeah, you probably want to cut that out. 
Oh, and I don't hate my, I'm, I'm too, I'm too, I'm too lovable to hate. So. <laughs> there you um. go. <laughs> there's, there's a quotable to take out of this conversation. <laughs> Jeffrey Reddick on himself. I'm too lovable to hate. Lovable to hate. <laughs> <laughs> That was a good question, though. That was a that was one I wasn't expecting. Yeah. Well, here's another. Not that I was expecting the other ones. I'm not, I wasn't not saying. I yeah, was yeah. It's, the a, it's only taken me <laughs> two <laughs> hours, but finally a question that you didn't anticipate yeah, you, has turned up. <laughs> you should start with that one first if you're really trying. To yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that'd be you intense. Said there was another. You said there was another one. <laughs> yeah. Well. What advice would you give to your 18 year old self? Oh, that's an easy one. Um, don't start drinking. <laughs> like, yeah. I did wonder if you'd say that when you told us, yeah. you know, you, you'd been sober yeah. for 14 years now. Yeah, because I was one of those rare people. I mean, I, you know, I think all of us can have addictive personalities. Um, but, you know, when I, you know, being an AA, they, they say that most alcoholics start drinking very young. So they say if, you know, if you haven't started drinking by the age of 19, the chances of you becoming an alcoholic are like 1% because you're just not, you know, you're, you're not wired that way. And most alcoholics I know have started drinking, but I'm like that 1% that, you know, I started drinking when I was like 20, when I was 20, I think, because I moved to New York and used to go out all the time, never had a drink, had a great time, went back to Kentucky to finish school and had to sit over the summer in my college town, which, you know, after living in New York, you know, living in a small town in Kentucky where there's no bars, it's a dry county, there's nothing to do except go to house parties, you're going to start drinking at some point. Right. <laughs> um, you, you know, if, if after being in New York, like it's, it's there's nothing else because everybody's doing it. So, um, so yeah, but I, I will say the, the, the biggest positive of going through what I went through is before I drank, I didn't understand addiction and I was very judgy because I never had the desire to drink before, you know, and so I, people would be out and they'd be like, Hey, you want to drink? I'm like, I don't need to drink to have a good time. You know, like, and I thought that if I thought that if people, I thought alcoholics were people that just didn't want to, didn't like, why don't they stop? Like, you know, they can just stop if they decide to stop. Like, so I was very, arrogant and ignorant about addiction. And I, I fear that if I hadn't had gone through it myself, um, that I would have, I would have never understood addiction. And now that I understand addiction, um, it allows me to deal with, first of all, deal with it when I have, you know, people in my life who are dealing with it, um, in a very compassionate way. And also I'm very open about being sober because I, I know, especially for artists, but it's, you know, in the South and Midwest, it's like, you know, it's pain medication stuff that's taking over, you know, like there's, there's addiction problems everywhere and there's still such a stigma about it. And there's such a, why don't people just stop? Like people who aren't addicts just think because they can have one drink and stop that everybody can. Um, so, you know, I, when I, I just talk about it because I know I always usually hear from somebody at least who is either dealing with it themselves um, and are just glad to hear that somebody got through it, you know, because it wasn't easy. You know, it took me like five, six years of being like, oh, I need to stop. I'm going to join AA. And then I would, oh, I, I, I figured this out. I'm going to quit AA. And then I'd be right back to where I started again. And then, it, you know, and then you start getting into the self-pity stuff. Well, obviously I'm not strong enough to stop doing this. I can't imagine, you know, going out and not having a drink, like my life's going to be over. It's all this, all this bullshit you build up in your head to, to keep you from getting sober. And then, you know, for me, it was just making that decision. Like I haven't done anything horrible yet. You know, like I haven't gotten a car accident. I haven't killed anybody. Um, you know, I haven't gone to jail. Well, I went to jail once for disorderly conduct. That's all. Um, just, being an ass on the street to a mouth and off to a cop. Um, right. <laughs> but, but, um, you know, I just, I was at home one day and I was like, you know what? I know I have a problem. I know the solutions there. I just have to, I can't do this for my friends. I can't do this for a guy. I have to do this for myself. 
you know, like I'm tired of, I'm just tired of it. So let's just give it up. And then once I did that and kind of started working the program, like, you know, for me, the desire was lifted, but I know for a lot of people, it never gets lifted. It's just, a, it's continually, it's, it's still continual work, but you know, yeah, I think that's, it's the best decision I made in my life. And the biggest regret I have, but I, do, I, on the bright side, I do think if I, like I said, if I hadn't gone through it, I have a feeling that I, I would be one of those assholes. Like if one of my friends told me they were an alcoholic, I'd be like, well, just quit drinking. And I wouldn't understand. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for spending the majority of your evening chatting with us. <laughs> this has been oh, the... a huge amount of fun. Oh no, yeah. absolutely. It's my pleasure. And a, I also want to thank you guys for having me on the, the podcast and, you know, and I usually, it usually comes up earlier in conversations, but the one thing that I, you know, one of the greatest blessings in my life is obviously having fans because we do our, we do what we do because we want people to watch it and hopefully enjoy it. And if it wasn't for the final destination fans, like, especially that I like, people will send me stuff and they're like, Oh, I'm sure you're sick of seeing this after all these years. I'm like, no, it feeds my soul. Keep sending me log truck memes. Yeah. So the day I die, I don't care because it's mm -hmm. like, honestly, if it wasn't for the fans, like that's why I love going to conventions and doing podcasts and talking to people is, is, is really like, I wouldn't have a career. Like if it weren't for fans, like I would, I just wouldn't have, I would not, I would have no career. So I'm honestly just so like grateful that, people are still interested in, in talking about my stuff, you know, <laughs> like, it's like, who, you know, who would have thought, you know, if I was 14, it's like, yeah, you're going to have a movie come out when you're 30 and you'll be talking about it when you're 50. I'd be yeah. like, what? <laughs> so, um, again, it's, it's, thank you guys for having me on the show and just, uh, any fans listening again, I, I just appreciate each and every one of you. Um, and if you all want to have a career in the, in the arts, you know, again, you have, the equipment you have resources if you're a writer to find scripts online you can shoot stuff on iphones you're going to get better you're going to start off thinking you're great and not be great my first i go back and reread some of my first scripts and i'm like these are really horrible <laughs> like um but there's a spark of something there because it's any kind of craft you have you get better as you use it so your first you know, the first thing you write, if it's a short story or if it's an article, it's not going to be perfect. But every time you write, you're going to get better and you're going to learn lessons. And same thing if you paint or if you sing or if you direct or act. Um, so don't listen to people who are like, what's your real job going to be? <laughs> um, you know, like this can, you know, being an artist can be your real job. But, you know, also keep up with like what's going on with the technology in the world, like the platforms where you can put your work up, like just keep up to date on what is going on in the world around you, because there's so many more options out there now than there were when I was growing up. Um, so it's definitely not impossible at all to like, you know, if this, if this poor hillbilly, if this poor blay, gay black hillbilly from Kentucky could, you know, make it in Hollywood, anybody can make it in Hollywood. Like I had no, you know, family connection or anything. So yeah, and you don't have to make it in Hollywood. You can make it from your own state now. You can make movies in your hometown. It's like find like-minded people around you um, and healthy people around you. Um, healthy is very important <laughs> because because um, mm -hmm. we artists can also be a little you know fucked up and or other other have other people around us who are really fucked up because we want to take care of them. Um, and that's not going to help <laughs> you. So healthy, creative people find your tribe and and just make art, you know? All right. Where mm -hmm. can our listeners connect with you? Um, they can follow me on the Twitter. I'm kidding. I know it's just Twitter. I just like to sound <laughs> old. Um, <laughs> um, it's Jeffrey A. Reddick on Twitter. Um, and that's my Instagram handle as well. Uh, it's so funny because I'm not a, like, we're going to location scout for the, a new movie. I'm going to hopefully be directing in the fall. So I'm going to maybe start Instagramming more, but I just feel like, cause I'm writing all the time, like that I don't do anything interesting enough to constantly post on Instagram about. So I'm not on there much. So I like Twitter cause I have more followers <laughs> but, and I, it's easier to tweet. 
because I, you know, I don't put mm-hmm. pictures up, but I'm going to start Instagramming too. But it's Jeffrey A. Reddick on Twitter or Instagram. Um, and I definitely, if anything exciting is coming up, I'll post about it. Um, and stuff that I like. I, I spend most of my time posting about either films that I see that I like or articles that I like and things like that. Like, so I only go crazy self promoting. It's like a movie's opening in like two weeks. <laughs> the rest of the time, it's like promoting other people's stuff. But, um, but yeah, you can you can stalk me on those sites. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. And if you're a prince, if you're a prince, there's a couple of other sites you can find me on. But um, there I'm you totally go. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Do you have any final thoughts to leave our listeners with? Any final, I know I was going to try to think of a final joke or final, something with final in it. No, I just, you know, <clears throat> the thought I'd like to leave them with is again, just appreciation, you know, because I, I, that's one thing that is never lost. I mean, I'm going to be a horror fan first and foremost, no matter what I do. And so just uh, how appreciative I am, you know, of the fans, because this is the one genre, here I go on another, but this is the one genre, like, there, there aren't, like, romance comedy conventions, and, you know, this is the only genre where people, that I feel where people, they don't just care about this, who the actor is, like, they know everything about everybody that worked on their favorite horror films, mm-hmm. so they know the writers, they know the directors, the set direct- decorators, they know the person that had one line, or who was sitting in the bar at this one scene, like, that kind of passion is such a wonderful thing. And, you know, this is a business where writers, especially in features, don't get appreciated. It's always about the stars and the director. Um, so just even as a writer to like have people even recognize me before it was cool to recognize writers was like amazing. Um, and, you know, I appreciate writers cause that's what I have done, but it's just, it's, yeah, the, the, I just think the horror horror community is just the fans are so amazing, um, and yeah, I'm just so grateful, you know. So that's it. Gratitude, gratitude to the fans and to people like you who who actually want to want to talk about you know projects and will let me ramble. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and humor me, and also bring up great questions and support other and you know who's also are supporting people in the genre. Um, Again, like every, yeah, this is, it's just fun. It's just a fun family community. So, um, appreciate, I appreciate you guys having me on the podcast and obviously you've got all my info. So, um, it's, oh yeah. And happy 400th episode too. Like, this is like, it's, it's cool to be on a special like episode too. Um, so maybe you have to have me back on your 800th. Okay, there we go. You've, you've heard oh, you can it do it now. Before, you can do it. You can do it before then. I'm just. I, I, you can do it before then, but just, I just, yeah, that sounds like too long. Yeah, c- c- call me it when you're up to 800. No, that. Did, I didn't mean that. <laughs> yeah, we start doing like two a year. <laughs> so like 30. <laughs> hey, how are you doing? <laughs> can you? You're like, can we just bury Jeff with his phone and bury us with our phones, and we'll call, we'll Skype him from the grave? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that could probably be the most popular podcast. I mean, oh. what a niche. Be- beyond the grave. <laughs> beyond the grave. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, again, thank you guys for having me on. And um, happy 400th episode. That's a really big milestone. So kudos to you guys for, for, um, for reaching it. That's a huge milestone. Thank you so much for listening to episode 400 of the This Is Horror podcast with Jeffrey Reddick. Wow, what a conversation we had, Bob. And I mean, I'm so glad that we're welcoming in the 400 era with this because, I mean, this is setting the bar high and this is the standard that I want in forthcoming conversations. Yes, it was really, really incredible conversation. Um, he is uh, just amazing uh, and so generous with his time as well uh, to kind of get into, you know, the nuts and bolts of, of making of what it takes to make a film. And uh, to me, probably the strongest part is like a word, words of encouragement to people who want to create and what you 
what you can do. And it, it's just, I, I, I loved it. I thought it was great. Oh, yeah. And the next episode, we have Craig Clevenger, an absolute literary titan, the author of the Contortionist Handbook. And again, we are setting the bar pretty damn high by having Craig on as episode 401. Now, of course, if you're thinking, oh, Craig Clevenger, I wish I could be listening to that now. Well, my friend, you're in for a treat because if you become our patron, patreon.com forward slash this is horror, then you could be listening right now because it's available. So don't delay, become a patron, submit questions to future guests, including Anthony Johnston. So he is going to be one of our repeat guests, one of those five lifelines that we've got. And I mean, the reason is he's the writer of Resident Evil Village, and you might have detected over the last 400 episodes, we're pretty big Resident Evil fans, so we were not going to pass up that opportunity. So that is coming soon. If you want to submit a question to Anthony Johnston, become our patron, and you can submit questions to each and every other guest as well. So check it out, patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Okay, before we wrap up, a little bit of an advert break. Spacefaring researchers disturb an ancient horror. An enchanted object curses a grieving widow. A haunted reel torments a film student. A murder trial hinges on a chilling testimony. Howls from Hell. A new horror anthology from Hal Society Press. Stephen Graham Jones calls it quality horror by true believers who can write. With a forward by Grady Hendrix, Howls from Hell unveils the horror writers of tomorrow with spine-tingling stories from P.L. McMillan, Shane Hawk, J.W. Donnelly, Lindsay Ragsdale, Amanda Nevada DeMell, and others. Available now in paperback, ebook, and audiobook from Amazon and most other major booksellers. Howls from Hell. Dracula's Death. The 1921 Hungarian silent film was the first motion picture to ever depict Count Dracula. While the film itself is lost, a prose adaptation has survived. Strangers from Nowhere is proud to present an illustrated English translation of Dracula's Death, available in ebook and paperback on Amazon, and as a numbered and signed hardcover edition at strangersfromnowhere.com. Well, Bob, that about does it. The 400 era is here. Do you have any words that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Anything you'd like to say about this new era that we've entered? Well, I'm just, I'm super excited about uh, just the, you know, the, the direction, the bar that we're setting. Uh, you know, we... Uh, we 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 are constantly trying to improve, and and I, you know, I think I think I think our listeners are going to see, you know, not that not that we needed improvement. I think they're going to be excited about the direction that we're taking with the podcast, and that that's to me, I'm excited about it. And if I'm excited, then everyone should be excited. Oh, I think there's always room to improve, and so mm-hmm. yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad that we're doing it, and I mean, we have got a number of great writers and a number of great screenwriters, conversations that are in the works, so I think you're all going to be very impressed. As always, if you've got people that you want from the horror world, from literature, from cinema, send us a tweet at This Is Horror and let us know who you want to hear on the show. Definitely. So, until next time, for 401 with Craig Clevenger, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. (laughs) 
This is Horror Podcast. Yeah, one of my friends is um, he does uh, he doesn't do all of them, but he does some of the. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, perfect. Oh, okay. It just got ruined. I dropped my phone for a second and it was quiet. And I was like, did I maybe yeah. I disconnected this? I mean, um, that definitely when I drop my phone <laughs> and I'm not listening <laughs> into it, it does make it harder to hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's I can never. T- I just. I know I talk a lot. <laughs> I don't mean to. Um, I just get excited talking about stuff. And, um, you know, you know, writers, we're like solitary people. Yeah. Um, so we yeah. spend, we spend mm-hmm. so much time by ourselves that it's like, we're talking. This is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just talk yeah. more. Um, yeah. So I just kind of just keep yammering. And then I also tell all my business. So it's like, um, which I have, you know, again, just a few year and if you like, oh, we can edit some of this stuff out. I won't be offended if you edit anything, but don't feel like you have to edit anything on my account. No, I, think it, <laughs> I think it's all been yeah. really interesting. And I think oh, yeah. maybe in terms of the way you talk and think is a little similar to me, because often if Bob and I are doing a and a session, then I'll say, wow, I can't wait to find out what I think about this because when I start talking and answering a question, I'm literally processing that in real time. Mm -hmm. So if I'm answering your question, I don't necessarily know my conclusion, particularly if I haven't thought about it before until it concludes. And Yeah, yeah. No, I'm the same way. 